Good morning, everybody. It's um, 10 o'clock, and I'd like to welcome you all today to today's meeting of the Suffolk Health Scrutiny Committee. I am Councillor Jessica Fleming, and I am chairing the meeting today. <coughs> the meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on the Council's website while we are in public session. A recording of the meeting will be available for um, subsequent viewing. Members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast the meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded, providing due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance in line with the Council's published guidance. We are not expecting a fire drill today. In the event of an alarm sounding, please leave the chamber by following the fire exit signs <clears throat> at the rear of the chamber. Evacuation instructions can also be found on page four of the agenda. May I remind you, please, to speak clearly into the microphones. Avoid placing things such as papers <clears throat> or equipment in front of the microphone, as this will affect the sound on the live broadcast and in the chamber. May I also ask you to turn mobiles and laptops into silent mode and to um, <clears throat> also silence your notifications, please. And finally, just a reminder that due to the amount of business we are conducting today, we will be having a lunch break and reconvening afterwards to complete the business after lunch. Thank you very much. Before moving on, may I take the opportunity to welcome two new members of our committee. Um, Councillor Margaret Maybury represents Baber District Council and Councillor Christine Shaw um, represents Ipswich Borough Council. Welcome to you both. Um, can you just, um, just put your hands up so everybody knows who you are and, and announce. This is Margaret and Christine from Ipswich. <clears throat> the first item on our agenda is the election of a vice chairman. And this is something we do every year. Um, Inga Lockington is currently the vice chairman. And I would like to um, propose that she continues in this role. Do I have a seconder? Um, Councillor Richards, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Inga Lockington has been duly elected vice chairman for the 22-23 municipal year. Um, congratulations, um, Councillor Lockington, if you are watching. Public participation. Item two is um, <clears throat> allows an opportunity for the public to um, speak. However, we've had no applications for today's meeting. Item three, apologies for absence and substitutions. Um, we, ha we do have a couple of um, apologies. Councillor Inga Lockington and Councillor Margaret Marks. We have no substitutions. Declarations of interest and dispensation. Do members of the committee have any declarations of interest or declaration or dispensations they would wish to put forward? Um, I take it there are none. Thank you. Minutes of the pri previous meeting, agenda item five. Are members content to approve the minutes of the last meeting by general affirmation? Um, can I just have a show of hands, please, for the previous minutes, for those who are there? Thank you very much. Um, the minutes are duly approved. <coughs> I will now move into the main agenda item um, for this morning, the um, implementation, implementation of the Health and Care Act 2022 and the role of integrated care boards. This is an update on the implement implementation of the Care Act and the roles and responsibilities of the new integrated care boards. And um, of course we have both um, Suffolk and Norfolk centred boards to consider today. Um, <clears throat> this item is not a scrutiny review, but it's an opportunity for us to clarify our understanding of the new arrangements and to ask any questions. Um, I would like to our panel members to introduce themselves. Um, we could start with, with you, Susanna, and then move through. 
So good morning, um, good morning Chairman. Um, I'm Susanna Howard and uh, in fact my title changed as of Friday. I'm now the Integrated Care Partnership Director for the Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care System and I'll explain what that means in our presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Barker. I'm Director of Corporate Affairs and ICS Development for Norfolk and Waveney ICB. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Amanda Lies, Director of Workforce and People for our new ICB. Thank you. And, and Simon? Good morning, everybody. I'm Simon Morgan. I'm Associate Director for Communications within the ICB. Thank you. Sorry, I think, sorry, Su Susanna um, is going to introduce the presentation. I think, Susanna, you've integrated the slides from both the um, Norfolk and Waveney and the Suffolk and North East Essex ICS um, systems. And also, members, we may ask questions, I think, as we go along. Um, there will be appropriate pause points, I think, which will become obvious, rather than waiting for them all at the end. Thank you, Chair. So um, this is going to be very much a double act. Um, so um, together with my colleague Karen Barker from the Norfolk and Waveney Integrated Care System, we're going to go through um, the new arrangements together. So um, are we going to be able to see slides? Oh, on the slide. I can't see where we are. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're on the first slide, are we? Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to go through these together. So Karen and I will both handle different parts of the agenda and um, we'll, we'll um, take you through some of the new arrangements. So the things we're going to cover um, this morning are as follows. So um, the new Health and Care Act 2022 actually took effect on Friday, just on Friday, just gone, Friday the 1st of July. So for both of our integrated care systems, there were some um, uh, events, if you like, that took place on Friday, which we'll tell you a bit more about, first and foremost, um, the, about how the new, um, the, each of the systems launched um, the new Health and Care Act. Um, then Karen is going to give you a little bit of an overview of the um, key points in the Health and Care Act 2022. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what it means to be now thinking and working as health and care systems. Um, and then um, Karen will talk you through specifically the arrangements in Norfolk and Waveney. I will talk you through the arrangements in Suffolk and North East Essex. Um, Karen's going to give you a bit of an overview about the development of provider collaboratives um, specifically, and then I'll round up at the end with a few key issues um, and next steps. The other thing to say is we have included in this a couple of film snippets, just because we thought that might bring to life a little bit about what we're going to talk about this morning. I'm, I'm hoping that these work well for obviously you in the chamber and also those watching elsewhere as well. So I'm going to start with those launches of um, the integrated care systems on Friday the 1st of July. So um, obviously for um, both of our integrated care systems, for integrated care systems across the country, there are 42 integrated care systems across the country. Those have been operating really as informal systems for some time and what the new um, Health and Care Act does is it moves those integrated care systems into now statutory arrangements which we'll talk you through um, in just a moment. Now the transition of those integrated care systems across the country was of interest to local media so what I'm going to show you very first is just, just under three minutes which was the coverage if you didn't see it you may have seen it on Friday evening but this was the media coverage from um, the launch of the ICS in um, Suffolk and North East Essex, which was covered by ITV Anglia on Friday evening. For many months, we've reported on the cracks in our health system and even in some of our hospitals becoming more visible. Southern University Hospital, what is going on? The ambulances stacking up outside A&E departments, the young people stuck on waiting lists for mental health treatment, the staffing crisis in social care. 
Well, today, a new race to improve those services begins. As of midnight, clinical commissioning groups were scrapped and replaced with something called integrated care systems. That means bringing lots of organisations together to try and join up care. Here, Suffolk and North East Essex are holding an expo at Newmarket Racecourse. The question echoing around the home of racing, though, is what difference will that actually make to patients? When you're seeking support from the health and care sector, wherever it is that you make contact, you want to hear that somebody can help you. We can do. You know, if I can't help you specifically, I know somebody who can. This change makes that possible. The new partnership system involves everyone from GPs, pharmacists and volunteers to mental health trusts, hospitals and councils. They'll take decisions together on how money is spent. Nick Hume has seen plenty of NHS reorganisation during his 40-year career, but the boss of Ipswich and Colchester Hospitals insists that this shake-up has the greatest chance of success. For far too long we've worked in silos in the NHS and in social care, we've worked to different agendas often, there's been an element of competition. The changes will mean that we come together, we look at budgets differently, we look at serving our communities differently, we spend less time and energy arguing with each other and working towards our communities. Nick is keen to see more investment in community care in a bid to take the pressure off A&E departments, an idea backed up by the region's stretched ambulance service. One of our, our big aspirations here in the East of England is to look at how we can make sure that we get the right service to the right person when they call us. So that might be an ambulance or it might be a car like uh, the car we have here today. It might be a community service and it may not be a paramedic, it might be a community nurse, it might be a physiotherapist or something like that. That's very much what we want to do and we hope, we're hoping and believe that the, uh, the ICSs will help us to achieve. It might not have been much of a spectacle, but health chiefs say this first integrated care board meeting is significant. A small moment of health history, a large challenge ahead. Rob Setchell, ITV News, Newmarket. Friday for Suffolk and North East Essex we welcomed um, in actual fact just almost a thousand people to Newmarket Racecourse. It included um, uh, obviously lots of stakeholders from across the health and care sector um, uh, but also many many members of the public. We had um, everything from sick formers from a local school who came to show us um, some of their thinking around um, how we could achieve net zero. Um, uh, we had a human library, uh, we had a significant community zone and um, even the Hadley Community Choir performing as well. So it was a real pleasure to, to have everybody there um, for um, discussion around um, this kind of key transition for us as a system. Um, obviously there was lots of content shared on Friday, um, but one of the things that we shared for Suffolk and North East Essex was some data that had actually been published um, just a couple of weeks beforehand. So Ed Garrett, the Chief Executive of our NHS Integrated Care Board, shared some data from um, an organisation called Carnal Farrah, who, um, leading up to the transition of integrated care systems across the country, had looked at um, the performance of integrated care systems across um, all of these metrics that you can see on the screen here. Um, so a whole variety of different metrics around um, what they um, uh, accounted for as sort of you know good indicators of, of integration and compared those against um, levels of deprivation in integrated care systems. So Suffolk and North East Essex, you can see picked out there the little dot with it says SNE with an um, arrow pointing to it, was um, had the second high score in the country. We also split out that data across our three place-based alliances as well and you'll see that all three of our place-based alliances also perform equally very high as well, um, including um, the one of our three alliances, which is in North East Essex, which um, has quite a significantly high um, uh, uh, number of people living in um, deprivation. So that was just a snippet of some data shared on Friday. And just lastly, in terms of sharing some content for Friday, um, uh, we did have a message on Minister uh, on Friday from um, uh, Ed Arger, who certainly at that point uh, was Minister of State for Health, and I'll just show you literally just 20 seconds of what he had to say as just part of his address for our opening about um, the ICS. In Suffolk and North Essex, I North East Essex ICS, Professor Will Pope, Matthew Hicks and Kevin Bentley and many others in the NHS, local government, voluntary and community services are working extremely hard to deliver health and care services for the local residents, Suffolk and North East Essex um, support. 
It was one of the best performing areas in England for COVID-19 vaccination programme delivery. And that same spirit and ambition is true of its approach to integration. The ICS is well developed with residents already experiencing the benefits of joined up working from Bury St Edmunds to Colchester. Okay, so just finally to say that we're very pleased to um, at least have seen the integrated care system get off on the right foot. Um, but obviously there's lots of work to do and we're going to talk to you in just a moment about what the new arrangements of the ICS will be moving forward. But now I'll hand over to Karen. Thank you, Susanna. Um, so... Sorry, <laughs> again, along with the other 42 systems um, in the UK, we uh, also launched uh, Norfolk and Waveney um, ICB on the 1st of July. Um, so we didn't hold a, a big expo um, like SME, but we did hold an event in person um, and invited the public. We had um, around 100 people in the room, but many, many more watching on um, YouTube, um, culminating in around about 1,000 people um, watching and, and and joining and taking part. There were opportunities um, for the public online to ask questions and we had a lot of questions um, via that forum as well. Um, so as well as the formal bit to establish the board, we did also have um, a section about uh, people with lived experience where we focused on carers and we had a very powerful um, presentation from a young carer and also a, a carer from um, an older um, generation talking about their experience of health and care within Norfolk and Waveney. Um, we then opened up to an open public session um, for question and answers to the new board um, so that people um, could basically put the things that were, were troubling them or burning to ask uh, to the new board. Um, and that was really interesting with a wide range of, of questions there. Um, everything from cancer weights to autism um, that the board um, answered. So if any of you haven't seen that, that is still on uh, YouTube and you, you can um, watch that if you, if you wish. Um, so I think um, all in all a successful launch and there's a picture there um, in case you weren't aware but that's Tracy Bleakley um, there in the blue, um, our Chief Executive and, and the Right Honourable Patricia Hewitt who's our Chair. So just moving to the next slide, we just have a slide here on our mission and goals. Um, we've put this in the pack so you could have a look at this at your leisure, but I think it's quite a nice slide setting out the kind of summary of our um, Norfolk and Waveney ICS along with our, our goals. So I'll move now um, to the next slide, um, just a few key points around the Health and Care Act, if I can. So I think it's fair to say many of us have been through a lot of reorganisations um, with the NHS over time, but um, this one did feel like uh, one of the biggest certainly in, in recent times, certainly in the last 10 years. And, and I think it really signals a change in the way we work within the NHS. Um, so the key change is previously we would have a commissioner provide a split uh, whereby the CCGs were commissioned and it was very much about um, buying services from the providers and holding them to account via contractual means usually and now we've moved more to um, an integrated model so rather than a kind of more adversarial model I suppose with partners it, it's now more we all work together with the uh, money that we have um, to work uh, the best way that we can to integrate and work with our, our services to solve the problems of our systems. So I think that's the key um, change that, that's happened. Um, and certainly it felt very different um, at our launch, and I'm sure it did at, at SNE as well, just having um, the different providers and the different partner members around the board. Um, we also have, um, I think it's the same in SNE as well, VCSE, sector member um, on our board. So this is very much now a system-wide board rather than previously um, focused more on, on commissioning with the providers wouldn't have been on the board. Um, so I think that although there was a lot of focus on the 1st of July and getting to that launch, I personally feel that this is just the start. It's, it's day one for us now in, in working to integrate further and to really try and signal some improvement um, throughout the system. Moving to the next film. Sorry. It's the film. Thank you. So, um, is this a... <clears throat> we, we'll just take a couple of questions, if, if anyone has any questions on the introduction. Um, Councillor Maybury, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that um, 
for that in introduction. Uh, that was really useful. Could we just go back to that previous slide? Because I'm trying to point out which bullet point it is. One, two, three, four, number four. The Act does not have any particular implications for the involvement of the private sector in delivering clinical care in the NHS by reducing the role of competition, etc. How is that going to work? Please. Um, I think that, um, so by reducing the role of, of competition, um, we're hoping that, as I said, we will work together rather than um, uh, basically um, procuring services. So at the moment, there's a lot of um, work goes on to procuring um, and to um, doing things via competitive tender. And whilst those rules are still in place currently, um, I think the work more is around now looking for solutions and working together rather than being sort of contractually obliged. So I see what you're, you're saying there. How does that work if your partners aren't all you know, up for that and aren't all um, keen to do that? Um, but I think that's where the uh, partnership comes in and where we're working more closely together now. So for example, in Norfolk and Waveney, our directors of finance now all get together all, all the time to uh, work through financial problems, whereas before it was a little bit more um, a contractual base with moving the money. So while I think it's, it, it does um, relate to more partnership working, but I think, um, I think we'll get there and the, and the rules now and the, the sort of direction of travel that we've got with integration allows us to do that, whilst, whereas before it was more around contracts and procurement, there's definitely like a kind of signal away from that kind of thinking now. Um, does that help um, your understanding of, 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 of what that bullet means? No, not really. I always think the proof of the, the pudding will be in the eating. Um, and I'm just trying to find out whether that means if, for instance, and I'm going to use a, a couple of examples, and you'll have to stop me, um, Chairman, if you think I'm right, wrong. Um, for example, New Medica here in Ipswich, they do a lot of cataract operations. Um, so I'm wondering whether it's going to be, it doesn't matter how much they charge, we'll just accept them for doing it. Um, so that's my example. And I'm not being disrespectful to New Medica um, at all because they were offering my late husband some um, wonderful treatment. So please don't think that I am. But I, I'm just wondering how that's going to work. And I would be interested in a few months' time to actually find out how that is working and whether the finances are not matching up. Um, I didn't say that, thanks. Su Susanna, would you like to come in? So, so a really good example of how um, some of these changes have already begun to, 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 to deliver some benefits are um, the, one of the things that I think has been really helpful in the way that the Suffolk and North East Essex integrated care system has evolved has been the move to a guaranteed income contract for um, our acute hospitals. So by putting that in place, you start to shift the relationship between the commissioner and the provider to one that, if you like, enables them to work in a much more joined up way um, in the way that now we've got with the providers sitting around the table at the board around how money is spent as well. So it actually starts to shift the, the, the conversation. Um, one of the things we're going to tell you about in just a little while, which I think, I think we could come back to this issue, is the development of provider collaboratives as well that if we don't have different trusts competing with one another for contracts and they're collaborating together, then you can start to talk about things like, you know, sharing staff or sharing resources or, um, you know, working much more flexibly and enabling some clinicians, if you like, to reach out and not feel as if they're restricted by contractual boundaries um, between organisations. So I think it really is, I think you're absolutely right, that the kind of proof is, if you like, in, in, in kind of how things feel on the ground. Um, the reason why we chose a, a brand of can-do health and care is we want to enable everyone to be able to be can-do and not to say, well, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to help you, but in actual fact, it's not in the contract for my organisation to do that. What we all want to hear as patients and as carers and so on is when, when we need support is, I can help you or certainly I can just reach out to my colleague who may be in a different organisation, but we can work between us to work out how to deliver the best thing for you and not to feel restricted by some of those I feel like what I think have been previously have been barriers to that collaboration. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do, do go ahead. Unless, unless anyone... Uh, yeah, Councillor Sower. Hi, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased you um, celebrated your launch very well. That's good. Um, and I think the idea to overcome silos is very important, to collaborate and to work together. But when do you think actually you will show data that you improve the system, like reducing waiting lists in the hospital, reducing the waiting list to see a GP, reducing the waiting list to see a dentist? When do you think this will actually happen? So, if I may, um, so some of the data that I showed you a moment ago, um, that was a report which was published two weeks before we were very pleased with because all of those indicators which I can go back to were, I, d I know I took the slide off the screen very quickly, but um, if I was just to flip back to it, um, a lot of those things, they, those are those types of indicators. So we can already see that, that we've been working as an integrated care system um, working very cl closely in partnership, working in a way that's integrated in Suffolk and North East Essex for quite some time, and that data is beginning to show you some, some movement on that. But it's not enough. Um, what we ultimately want to do is we want to um, show a benefit to the population in terms of measurable differences in outcomes. So um, we've for some time been implementing um, uh, um, some thinking around what we call outcome-based accountability, where what we're doing is looking at ultimately the measures of benefits and outcomes in the population and actually looking at um, you know not just delivery in terms of kind of say waiting times and activity but ultimately are people happier healthier are they actually living longer and, and all of those things because ultimately that's the test of what we're all doing together collectively so it's got to be both things it's got to be this type of data but it's also got to be measurable differences in terms of people's health and well-being thank you very much um, Councillor Richards. Yes, so the, the thing I worry about is the financial control because it's now so very complicated that the financial control is going to be very complicated. I mean, there's a huge amount of money being thrown at the NHS since the pandemic and it looks like a black hole. We've got a huge amount now of admin staff which were put in place because of, of the uh, booster campaigns who haven't disappeared. Um, and so it looks to me like the black hole is going to get, to get bigger and that's my worry. Um, we'd like to answer that. Okay, so I'm, I'm not a, a finance <laughs> director in there, but the one thing that we've been doing for some time is that joining up um, uh, our directors of finance across each of our partner organisations, and also um, for some time we've been operating what's known as a system control total. So this is where we bring together all of those budgets and actually have those um, leading those budgets working collectively to make sure that the system overall balances for the reasons that you say is that we don't want everybody sitting there protecting their own budget um, if it is the case that one area of the system requires you know perhaps more resource than was originally envisaged at the beginning of the year we now have the flexibility to move resources between organizations collaborative you know in agreement and the other thing is is that um, again we've got um, our providers who ultimately are spending, if you like, they're delivering services using those resources around the table, if you like, part of that decision making about how our resources are allocated and what the priorities are. And I think that's a really key difference now. So when I move on, we're going to show you the board structures. I think that'll start to come through. You'll start to see that that decision making, it brings everybody around the table. It doesn't leave those providing provider services saying, well, it's somebody else's problem whether or not the NHS budget balances overall. Everybody's part of that and responsible for that. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um, should we move on through a few more? Or, um, Councillor Robson, yes. can you hold your question? Or would you like to answer it, ask it right now? Oh, well, I was just going to ask him to bear it in mind. Perhaps you can answer it later. I'm concerned about, um, obviously, the National Health Service has always been structurally very administration heavy. Um, and what difference is this change going to make to the over, overall management at administration costs of the system, are we going to end up dragging money out of the front line for the administration? This is what worries me. So one of the benefits of um, the, uh, the Health and Care Act and that move away from competition and towards collaboration is that 
if we've got less burden around all of that kind of procurement and contracting work, in actual fact, it will reduce the cost of that. So the new NHS integrated care boards need, to, they're not a relabeling of clinical commissioning groups, they need to be entirely different organisations, much more focused on um, actually achieving um, health and wellbeing outcomes to the population rather than, as you say, servicing kind of lots of contractual administrative work, um, which, to be honest, if you like, arguably added little value in the past. So it enables us to, to actually um, uh, stop doing some things which didn't add value in the past, but actually focus on some of the areas like prevention and population health that we know really are much more important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good question. Um, please do carry on. Okay, so what I was going to move on to do is just talk a little bit about um, uh, the importance of now the way we need to think and work as a system, as a health and care system, um, as opposed to um, uh, just separate organisations. So um, we, we've, we've introduced um, uh, the two um, integrated care systems that are responsible uh, together for the um, health and wellbeing for the population of Suffolk. Um, so um, you can see that both um, service overall um, very similar sized populations, Norfolk and Waveney population around about 1.1 million in Suffolk and North East Essex, a total population of around about a million people. Um, and um, this is a slide from Karen, this is the Norfolk and Waveney integrated care system and I love this slide because it just shows the diversity and the sheer range of partners um, that are involved in um, integrated care um, across um, uh, just one of those systems for a million people. Um, so, um, uh, but ultimately, if you like, you know, what we're all trying to do is whether we're in Norfolk and Waverley, whether we're in Suffolk and North East Essex, we're trying to solve this problem, aren't we? We're trying to solve the problem where, you know, health and care, if we're not careful, can feel as if um, we're bouncing between lots of different organisations. You know, we're not getting that can-do response when we ca make contact with the health and care sector. And we want to make sure that all of that, those resources really do meet the needs of the, 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 the people that we serve. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. We're trying to move away from um, health and care feeling like lots of interconnected um, but kind of separate siloed organisations, but actually a system that works for people. So the million dollar question is how do you organise a health and care system? And um, we've, had, we've seen over the years, haven't we, reorganisations that have come in with kind of, you know, a new idea about, right, everyone's going to be structured this way. This is going to be the, what I call the kind of cookie cutter mould, that in every part of the country the arrangements are going to be absolutely the same. I think what's different about the Health and Care Act is that it strikes a balance between some consistency, which you'll see, so the, some of the features in each system are the same. Each has an NHS integrated care board now, each has... Um, an integrated care partnership, but actually we've got the flexibility to tailor those arrangements to local circumstances, and that's really, really important because in actual fact, one size does not fit all when it comes to health and care, because health and care is so interconnected with where people live and, um, uh, and place. So quite often people will contact me and say, well, Susanna, can you send me the system structure chart? And, and I, I, I say, absolutely, here it is. This is our system structure chart. And, um, you know, in actual fact, you know, health and care is complex. You know, there are so many different agents. If you just think about, for all of us locally, if I think about, you know, the care home where my mother lives or the pharmacy where I go to pick up a prescription or the GP surgery that I attend or um, uh, other services that we go to, you know, there are so many different stakeholders who um, need to interrelate and work together. So what the Health and Care Act does is it starts to give us a way of working that supports us to work as a system rather than as a kind of set of contractual kind of organisations. Now, one of the things about all of that diversity and complexity is that it can be very tempting to say, well, actually, because things are so complex and diverse, let's get a structure in place. So um, I have spent, you know, the last 30 years of my... Um, uh, yes, I am that old. 30 years of my career... Um, in meetings that have looked like this, you know, where you know we've we've tried for the umpteenth time to come up with the ultimate structure that will suit health and care locally for an area, and I think what we've got now is an opportunity to kind of actually move away from that because it's not worked. We've we've seen multiple attempts to do that, 
we need to think not as a hierarchy in health and care. We need to think about um, uh, system leadership. And system leadership can feel a little bit messy. And that's because systems can be messy. So if you think about systems, if you think about ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef or the human body as a system, when you first look at them, they can look um, confusing and messy and what's going on and so on. But if you lean into either of those systems, you start to pick out specific bits of the system that deliver particular functions. So if you think about the human body as a system, the human body contains obviously lots of organs. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not many of my organs in my human body that I can do without. They all do something slightly different, but they all deliver an important function um, in the system that is my human body. So if you hold on to that idea, this is our new integrated care system now with the implementation of the Health and Care Act as a system with a series of organs. So the first is that the first new organ that the Health and Care Act introduces is a new NHS Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care Board. So this is a new organisation. It um, replaces, it will take on um, certainly what has been in the past, the role of clinical commissioning groups, but also some additional um, functions as well. Um, which have previously been managed by NHS England, so that those things are managed more locally. Um, so some elements of specialised commissioning or ophthalmology um, and some of those in dentistry and so on will move to that ICB. So that is a new statutory body introduced by the um, Health and Care Act. Another organ in the new kind of system is an integrated care partnership. Now that partnership is now a statutory partnership which is jointly formed by the NHS Suffolk and North East Essex, ICB, jointly and equally together with the two county councils in the patch that we serve, so Suffolk County Council and um, Essex County Council. And I'll show you a bit more about that in just a while, um, but it is jointly and equally chaired um, by um, senior representatives from each of those three organisations. The next, um, obviously, we, we still have statutory health and wellbeing boards, so those still exist as well, so they, they have a different function. Again, I'm going to come to that in just a little while, tell you a little bit about how the um, new ICS arrangements will interlink with the health and wellbeing boards going forward. And then, of course, thinking about um, Suffolk and North East Essex as um, different places within Suffolk and North East Essex, we have three place-based alliances. Now, our place-based alliances are focused mainly on delivery, and they're about bringing partners together in that very local area together to work together about how services can be delivered in a more integrated way. And then we have some other arrangements. We have some other organs. So we're going to tell you just a little bit about NHS provider collaboratives. So this is where um, different providers, so for example, West Suffolk Hospital and, and East Suffolk and North Essex um, uh, Foundation Trust are working collaboratively together now with some of those, as I said, the restrictions removed. We've got um, a voluntary community and social enterprise sector assembly forming, which is where voluntary community sector partners are coming together to collaborate to look to see whether or not we can do more innovative things and invest more around the voluntary community sector going forward. And non-executive chairs, um, elected members and lay members across all of the different partners in the system work together in particular to make sure that we have that non-executive elected member oversight um, of the way the system works. And then last but not least, we've got integrated neighbourhood teams and primary care networks across the system at neighbourhood level. All of those different organs are all different um, places where different stakeholders come together and collaborate at different levels. So whether it's about um, clinicians collaborating together in a very local community as an integrated neighbourhood team, or whether at the other end of the spectrum it's about you know, key um, uh, stakeholders agreeing strategy together for the system, we've got different ways in which this, um, people can collaborate and it's all of these ways of working that make up our integrated care system. And the other thing about all of those interconnected organs is that they're interlinked. None of them is more important, they're equally important and they do need to interlink together. They need to, we need to make sure that as a system we do, we have flow between those different organs in the system, that we need to know that we have um, people who are engaged and thinking at neighbourhood level, involved in thinking about strategy, for example. All of these things are really important. So, I'm going to pause there. Is there any questions, Chair, before um, I hand on to Karen, who's going to talk sp through specifically the arrangements in Norfolk and Waverley? Um, yes, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> Heike, you go ahead and then I'll ask mine. 
It's a weird comparison, organs, <laughs> so teams or groups. Which one is the brain? Um, so um, in terms of setting the strategy for the population, um, it will be the integrated care partnership that brings together, if you like, the, the, the nerve endings, if you like, of all of those partners <coughs> to think that in the context of health and wellbeing for the population about overall what's the strategy that we need for this population for Suffolk and how do we put in place a strategy that will then guide the delivery and what, if, if you like, everyone does as separate partners through the NHS Integrated Care Board or through social care or public health or voluntary community sector. So it's that collective thinking and that collective um, mutual accountability, if you like, for the system. So that's why the new legislation brings in these two different statutory mechanisms. Yes, an NHS Integrated Care Board, but making sure that the way that we think, and actually I'm going to show you a brain in just a minute in that context, um, uh, that we think differently and we think as a whole health and care system rather than just thinking about our individual organisations. So I'd say the ICP. Did that answer your question? Um, hey, I'll ask my question. I'm just looking at the previous slide where you have the various, you know, the main um, organs that form part of this body, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> Can, can we assume that the role of local authorities in, um, in providing the um, health services that are, that are provided that way, um, that our link into the system is through the health and well-being boards? Is that correct? Um, I think when we talk you through the arrangements, we can pick this out in particular. Hopefully, what you'll see is that the local authorities are interwoven through every part of the system. So, certainly in terms of jointly leading the integrated care partnership, the brain, um, but also um, as um, a seat around the table at the NHS Integrated Care Board, in terms of um, joint leadership of those place based alliances, in terms of linking up social care at neighbourhood level. Um, at every part of the system, uh, local authorities are key partners in the ICS alongside and equally alongside the NHS and so they feature in every part of that, those organs um, uh, around the system. Okay, thank you. Perhaps we could, um, we'll get on to that, um, you know, a little bit more later on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair. So I'll just take you through some of the arrangements um, that we have in, in Norfolk and Waveney ICS. Um, so I think we've um, already touched on this a fair bit in, in the conversation we've just had, but um, the slide there hopefully summarises the position in Norfolk and Waveney, um, where the ICB um, are fundamentally in charge of day-to-day -day running um, with the total budget of uh, around two billion a year. Um, and the, the functions of Norfolk and Waverley Clinical Commissioning Group have been transferred over to the board, and the same can be said of, of SNE. Um, we also have the Integrated Care Partnership in, in Norfolk and Waverley, um, and their first meeting will be on the 21st of July, so that will be um, set up on that day. Um, we've set that up so that the membership of the ICP um, is broadly the same as the um, Norfolk um, Health and Wellbeing Board. So moving to the next slide, um, as Susanna has explained, um, although the Integrated Care Partnership is a statutory committee of um, both um, the Integrated Care Board and the relevant county councils in each um, area, uh, we very much see it as a um, joint um, working arrangement whereby there are functions that the Integrated Care Board and the ICP have under legislation but there is a lot of um, shared working there you can see in, in the middle. So we very much see it as a, um, a partnership arrangement um, and there is also going to be um, an integrate, a member from the Integrated Care Partnership on our ICB. So once they're established on the 21st of July, they will nominate and put a member onto our board of our ICB, so further enhancing the linkages. Equally, the um, chair and the chief exec from the Integrated Care Board are also on the Integrated Care Partnership. Um, so this is trying to explain a little bit more about um, the detail behind the structures in Norfolk and Waveney. So as you see here, we have the Integrated Care Board and there are five um, place boards um, underneath them. Um, 
we are awaiting um, at the moment there should be some further guidance should have landed on Friday it may be in the inboxes now but around exactly around how delegations um, should work and the kind of constructs nationally that we'll put in place around places but generally they're going to be five uh, place areas and we'll be looking um, at delegating work to them um, hopefully in the coming year um, so that's very much working to the integrated care board then um, on the other side of the structure there the integrated uh, care partnership with the health and well-being board um, as i've said very very similar membership um, and in norfolk and waveney we have eight local authority um, sorry local health and well-being partnerships so they have um, they're based on district footprints across Norfolk and Waveney, and they um, include a wide range of partners, as you can see there, we've listed um, some of those. Um, and they will work um, with the Integrated Care Partnership in influencing the overall strategy for the system. Moving to our <coughs> next slide, um, we've just set out there the members of our board, so you're clear the different colours. Um, the oranges are the independent, kind of non-executive um, members of the board. Uh, then we have executive directors on the board. Um, you'll see this pattern is very similar to the rest in the country because a lot of these are mandatory um, kind of positions you have to have on the board. Um, then we've got our partner members, um, so we have um, a trust, a cute partner member, and a trust mental health and community um, partner members and also um, a primary medical services partner member. Uh, we have our two local authority partners uh, members, you'll see uh, one there from Norfolk County Council and one from Suffolk County Council. Um, our VCSE member Emma Ratza who's also our chair of our Norfolk and Waveney VCSE assembly um, and as I've set out there will be a member from the integrated care partnership that will be put forward shortly. Um, so we are fully recruited to that board with the exception of uh, one non-executive member that we're out, um, we'll be out to recruitment for in the next week or so, um, and also the Integrated Care Partnership member, as I mentioned. Um, so without getting into huge detail, um, I think some of you already um, indicated about how, how is all this going to work. So broadly in Norfolk and Waveney, we've, we've tried to set up a framework that is as simple as you're understanding. It's a very complex um, set of arrangements and we're trying to kind of simplify it slightly. So um, broadly how I like to explain this is, is the starting point is the money and the decision making all hits the ICB board. So that's kind of your starting point. And then obviously if we had all the money and all the decision making going into there, um, they, would get, they would fall over very, very quickly, there'd be too much. Um, so we would be, we're looking at delegating then to um, committees that sit under the board to do some of the functions and, and some of the work um, that the ICB board has and some of the functions. Um, and then supporting the committees, there will also be boards um, and um, you will see, you've heard of our, our director structure, we've got a number of directors that report to Tracy Bleakley, the chief exec, they will also have some, some delegation there. Um, and then the delivery groups are very much just groups getting on with the work. So I think we all, um, you know, can get caught up in governance and decision making and where things sit, but we're very, very keen in Norfolk and Waveney that we have a, a good set of groups that are actually getting on with some of these actions and some of the things that we need to change and, and get done. Um, so just to give you, I won't go into huge detail on all of this and tell you all the boards because it is quite vast, but these are the committees that we've set up that will support the Integrated Care Board. Um, and we will be looking at them in the next six months to see how they're working. Um, and as the further um, rules around delegation comes out, we'll be looking then to formally start delegating things into these committees. But just to say for the first time ever, um, these committees do have system partners now on them, people from providers um, and um, different people from across the system. Previously in the CCG, that wasn't permitted, but it, it now is. So we've, I think that's one key change around this um, legislation is that we're now allowed to have different system partners on these committees. So I think it really starts to open up um, our decision making across the system um, by using these, these committees. Um, and then we've just got a slide there around our ICP, um, just for your information there. So at the moment, um, Councillor Bill Burrett from Norfolk County Council is the chair designate. Um, the formal chair will be appointed on the 21st of July. 
Um, and we've just set out a slide there around the work that's been happening to um, uh, set up that integrated care partnership. Um, the first key output that you'll see from the integrated care partnership will be um, the integrated care strategy. Um, and I think the deadline for that is, is towards the end of the year, it's nationally set, so we'll all be following that um, across the, the country and getting out our, our integrated care strategies. So as I said before, um, our one there will be heavily influenced by our health and wellbeing partnerships um, made up um, on district footprints and feeding in to this integrated care partnership. So I'll pause there, pass to Susanna. Does anyone have any questions on, on particularly on the Norfolk and Waveney organisation? We're all clear. Great. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to I'm not going to repeat some of the detail that Karen's already covered, because obviously um, for some of the key elements of the um, sister going forward, um, there are similar arrangements in both Norfolk and Waveney and Suffolk and North East Essex. So um, for um, Suffolk and North East Essex, exactly the same. We have now introduced by the Health and Care Act um, a statutory um, uh, NHS Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care Board, which is on the left there. So essentially the way to think about that is this is a, a new statutory NHS organisation that has brought partners around the table, if you like, as part of its membership. I'll show you the board membership in just a moment. And then the other um, the new um, organ, if you like, is the um, statutory committee um, that connects all partners equally across the ICS. So that's the Integrated Care Partnership. Um, so that's convened equally and jointly by um, that NHS Suffolk and North East Essex, Suffolk County Council and Essex County Council. Um, but um, they, if you like, have, again, I'll show you the structure of that in a moment, have um, taken a very inclusive approach of bringing um, all partners in health care um, into that partnership. So this is the structure for the um, NHS um, Integrated Care Board. Um, you'll see on the left that, that we have um, very similar uh, to Norfolk and Waverley. So we have 16 voting members, if you like, on that board. So uh, on the left-hand side, four um, non-executive members of the chair, um, and then three non-executive members. And then um, four executive roles, chief executive, um, chief finance officer, director of nursing, and medical director. And then um, uh, a further eight partner members um, as um, voting members on that board. And uh, in the occasion that there were equal votes, um, the um, uh, casting vote would be with the chair. Um, other regular participants um, at the NHS Integrated Care Board um, will include um, the new, and I'll tell you about this in a moment, jointly appointed directors to our three place-based alliances. So those directors now report to both uh, NHS and local government um, as well. And also the non-executive members for um, the committees in each of the three alliances, again, are joint appointments between the NHS and local government. Um, and um, also our, um, the, the um, two um, local government co-chairs, um, for um, the Integrated Care Partnership, um, our regular participants alongside myself as the director for the ICP um, on that Integrated Care Board. So I think, um, and then last but not least, um, Health Watch are regular observers, of course, um, on the NHS Integrated Care Board. So hopefully what you'll see is that um, in terms of who's in the room and the way that board will work, it's a very heavily partnership-oriented um, set of arrangements. Um, we are nearly complete in terms of appointments to that NHS Integrated Care Board. The very last appointment should be made on the 20th of July, um, which is the appointment of a chair for the Voluntary and Community Sector Assembly um, for um, uh, the, the ICS. So we're just still going through the appointment process um, for that individual. But uh, you can see there um, the appointments to that NHS Integrated Care Board. I'm sorry, could I just stop you there, Susanna? Do you think on that <coughs> slide you could just run through yep. the um, seven people on the top row? Okay, so across the top, the chair is Professor Will Pope, um, who was previously the independent chair for the integrated care system, so he's the chair of the NHS Integrated Care Board. Chief executive is Dr Ed Garrett, director of nursing, Lisa Nobes. The medical director is Dr Andrew Kelso. Um, then we have a primary care partner member from Essex, Dr. Frieda Batty, uh, primary care uh, uh, partner member from Suffolk, Dr. Nick Rayner, 
Um, Nick Hume um, is um, uh, one of the three NHS provider partners alongside Craig Black um, from West Suffolk Hospital um, and also uh, Stuart Richardson from Norfolk and Suffolk Foundation Trust. And we currently have an acting director of finance, Chris Armit. Um, Suffolk County Council's partner member um, of that board is Sue Cook. Um, Patrick Warren Higgs from Essex County Council, partner member. And then we have three non-executive members, Steve Clark, Tony Curry, and Professor Steve Feast as well. Thank you very much. Um, so just in terms of um, some of the work that we've been doing, um, we've been following um, the, the theme in the Health and Care Act, which is around um, trying to move decision-making to as local a level as possible. So we've made early progress in Suffolk and North East Essex at developing arrangements through, at place, through our place-based alliances. We use the opportunity um, of um, transition to, to look further and more deeply at how the new NHS Integrated Care Board could move decision-making to a more local level through our place-based alliances. So you won't be able to read the detail on this slide because this is a very big functions and decisions map which was, um, I think, approved by the ICB on Friday at its first meeting. But basically to point out that what we've really set out to do is to where decisions can be made locally by place-based alliances, we've taken the step to do that. And that's why we've taken the step of strengthening um, the leadership and arrangements at place in our integrated care system. So in all three of our place-based alliances, um, we will have a jointly appointed, so jointly appointed by both NHS and local government partners, both upper tier and district council as, as well, local authorities, uh, non-executive member, and also a jointly appointed director from each of the alliances as well. So um, in fact, um, the new director, uh, alliance director for West Suffolk um, started in post on Friday, that's Peter Whiteman, um, and in Ipswich and East Suffolk, um, it's Maddie Baker Woods. Um, and what that does is it does create now further potential going forward because with that a joint appointment of a director and non-executive kind of equipment at place, it does offer the opportunity now to, to think more about perhaps how budgets could be brought together across different parts of the system at place and we could integrate and collaborate more um, for very local areas as well. So it does give us the potential to do that. And what that does is it puts us ahead of what was in this document. So on the 9th of February, the government published this white paper. It's referred to as the integration white paper, but it's full title you can see there. It was about joining up care for people, places and populations. And what that has set out is a proposal that for that type of arrangement in, in for places um, within integrated care systems across the country, so a governance model with that single person agreed by both local authorities and the NHS ICB accountable for delivery of a shared plan and shared outcomes at place. So we're in a good position um, to take that forward if that is introduced as suggested in spring 2023. For our integrated care partnership, um, uh, that met for the first time. It was very much a procedural meeting that we had um, in public at um, our expo event on Friday, but you can see here the three co-chairs for our integrated care partnership. So our integrated care partnership is co-chaired by Councillor Andrew Reid from Suffolk County Council, Councillor John Spence from Essex County Council and Professor Will Pope for the NHS Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care Board. And that's very much about reflecting that equal partnership. And what we've taken is a very inclusive approach to the membership. I think the, the quote we've used is that uh, having looked at it, we think it's far easier to solve the problem of you know, including and involving a large number of partners in the work of the ICP than it is to deal with the problem of people feeling as if they're excluded from the partnership. So we want to make sure that, pe that all stakeholders are involved in the partnership. And um, very much, if you like, we've set a set of core values at the heart of the partnership. Um, cleverly, they all begin with the letter C, courageous, collaborative, compassionate, cost-effective, community-focused and creative. Very much the way of working for the ICP will be outcome-focused, using that outcome-based accountability that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and my role um, in, is to support the three co-chairs and that partnership um, through my very small team, which is that um, secretariat for the partnership. So um, I showed you this little image a little bit earlier about the concept of that equal uh, partnership where um, everybody comes around the table 
Um, and um, that partnership, if you like, it will come together initially. Its first objective um, is to deliver that integrated care strategy, which is really key as a driver for delivery plans, not just for the NHS the ICB, but also other partners, including up to local authorities. And I'll just, just pause there. This is a quick overview of the membership of that um, integrated care partnership, which is currently coming together. Um, we've been going through a nomination process, um, but as you see, it does really now start to reflect the diversity of partners and also professional and lived experience perspectives in the system. Thank you very much. Um, I expect we have a few questions. Um, Councillor Richards. Uh, yes, that last slide, you had <coughs> adult social care, children's social care, social care providers, that's right. Um, now, I'm confused. I thought it was about health. So are you doing social services as well? What exactly do you mean? It must be a definition that I'm not quite understanding here. So the integrated care system brings together all partners in health and care. So that includes social care and public health as much as it does um, the NHS as well. So the inter by, when we're referring to the integrated care system, we mean health and social care and public health and the voluntary and community sector. So it is all of those. So they all are all represented in the partnership. But is that social services? I mean, I'm not, I mean, do you mean social prescribing? What exactly do you mean by social care? Can you explain it to me, please? It means all of those things. It means about, obviously, um, adult and children's um, social care. It um, refers to social care providers, domiciliary and care home providers. And it um, absolutely includes social prescribing and the role, um, particularly voluntary community sector providers who are who are very, very key to delivery of social, val um, well, social value and social prescribing in local areas. So has that expanded from what it was before with the CCG? Did they cover that as well? So I took, we talked about two different statutory arrangements. So yeah. for the NHS, it's about, if like the NHS working with partners around specifically decisions for the NHS, but the system is all partners. The, if yeah, it's come off the screen, but the, the NHS ICB is one member of that partnership. NHS providers are members of that partnership, but so are all of the other partners around the table, adult social care, children's social care, social care providers. Everybody is an equal partner in health and care. And it's collectively what all of those partners do, district and borough councils included, that collectively will drive the outcomes, health and care, out, health and wellbeing outcomes to the population. But I understand that the theory is just that somebody like the YMCA, for example, would that now be included in this, whereas in the past they would not have been included? Uh, absolutely. So the reason we've put in place a, an assembly model for the voluntary community and social enterprise sector is because there's actually many thousands of, of different agencies which range from very local community-based kind of groups through to bigger charities, some of which the more health-oriented charities like Macmillan are very key partners if you think about the provision of all our hospice organisations and so on as well. So the, the concept we've got, which I could bring to you if you want it for our volunteer CSE assembly, is that actually it um, aims to be inclusive of all of that diversity of different voluntary and community sector organisations and has been looking at the depth of issues about what it really takes for them to be able to be genuine equal partners alongside the NHS and local government in a system and that's very much the work that we've been doing around that and equally similar work in Norfolk and Waveney. So the YMCA in the past was funded directly through the so uh, Suffolk County Council wasn't it? It was a there was a big contract they won last year so the funding for that will now be integrated with the integrated care board will it? No, it's, it's not integrated with the NHS. What it means is that, um, uh, obviously, Suffolk County Council, alongside all of those other partners, would be part of setting that strategy for population health and thinking about what's really important for the health and well-being for the population that we serve. And then it's up to each sovereign member around the table for the NHS ICB or for Suffolk County Council or any other partner to translate that strategy into what that means, what they've agreed with partners in the strategy, in terms of what that means in terms of their own individual plans and delivery and strategy for that still sovereign organisation. So it's about a partnership between, it's about saying we're going to come together and, and work together on a single joined up strategy, which we all own for the population, 
but we will then be accountable for going, taking that forward and delivering that through our own individual organisation, the way that we plan our commissioning or whatever it is that we do as partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, I, I think the, the answers to those things will become more apparent as we get more um, into the functioning of the partnership. Um, is it possible just to come in um, very briefly? Please do, yep, Simon, thank you. yes. So um, I think one of the big challenges from my perspective as, as communications um, officer, one of the communications officer for our system, is to try and um, simplify what you've heard this morning. So, so come up with case study examples of what this means to local people and where the improvements have been made at ground level. So we're actively looking now for further case study examples of of all that Suzanne has described and Karen has described, and what does that mean to, to members of the public, and where have the improvements been made? So that, that's something that we're looking to do. We have been producing regular uh, ICS briefings over the past couple of years, so we're looking to further those, but include some more case studies of where, those, where what Suzanne has described has led to real improvements within communities, so do look out for those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Soa. Thank you very much, Chair. I think the theory sounds absolutely brilliant, especially the way you put it, Susanna. It sounds really like it's going to solve all our problems from one day to the other. Uh, but I do worry very much that the theory and the reality are extremely getting apart. So, for example, in Essex, 4,000 fewer children saw a dentist last year. Um, the British Dental Association suggested that um, unless practices face significant sort of, um, wait a minute, let me read it properly, sorry. So the British Dental Association said practices face significant barriers to expand capacity, warning tens of millions of patients in England will effectively lose access to dental services unless current regulations evolve. I ask you again, how certain are you that you can change it? And when do you come up with numbers, proper numbers, like in that actually the waiting times have been reduced properly, that the access to GP is there within, let's say, 14 days? When have you set your goals to be achieved? So, so in terms of dentistry specifically, uh, one of the changes through um, the Health and Care Act is to move the commissioning of um, dentistry services to integrated care systems. So up until now, I think I might have said they've not been the responsibility of integrated care systems. So it will actually be the responsibility of the NHS Integrated Care Board in terms of setting delivery plans locally. Now that will be the first time because they've not been within the responsibilities of clinical commissioning groups until now. They've sat with NHS England. So in actual fact, as a local system here in Suffolk, for the very first time we're able to be leading, if you like, and having those conversations for Suffolk about dentistry, which is different to the way they're managed at the moment by NHS England elsewhere. My role is in terms of the p overall partnership across the NHS, local government and the voluntary community sector, but I don't know whether, Karen, you're, you're part of um, uh, an NHS integrated care board or Amanda, if you want to add anything further. Yeah, no, um, I would just um, reiterate what Susanna said, that that function is coming over from April 23. So um, all systems are now working to, to move that function over and kind of understand the position, specifically with regard to dentistry um, and the other elements that are moving over to us um, so that we can start driving that forward. And it's all about working at a more local level, like we were discussing before about the pushing things down more to us to work on. So. I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to improve things. Um, I can't give you a deadline around that um, at all, but we um, will be working hard to receive that from NHS England, understand the problems, and then try and work on them. Um, I would suggest if you want a specific briefing around that kind of topic, um, that we can um, probably get the right people here to talk about that here, because this whole team's kind of working on that, that shift over. Um, it's not specifically something I work on, um, similar to Susanna, but I'm sure there's um, people we can get here to give you a fuller briefing on that. Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Shaw, you had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm just going to express a sort of sense of relief, really, that something that seems to be in a long time coming is actually coming, and that perhaps there's some what I've been asked talking about for two or three years is joined up thinking. 
um, and that's what I'm hearing. I think I'm also hearing the hows of all this. And you just mentioned just now um, sort of uh, proper case studies to inform people. The information I pick up from my residents is anxiety and fear because they don't really know what's going on. They hear, for example, that there's uh, something called Connect for Health, which helps them get out of hospital now, which is very welcome here in Ipswich. How are you actually going to convey this very complex information, as you've described, to our residents, to the people who are already in a muddle? Uh, they don't quite know uh, how to access GP easily anymore. Um, people who are uh, perhaps not very internet able, for example, are being told you've got to look things up online. Uh, people who are perhaps disadvantaged, don't have so much ready money, uh, can't afford to easily access things. So it, from, in my mind, it's the how is this all going to work for the people? I think there was actually a slide which showed that sort of people as, as against systems. There's a conflict there, isn't there? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Go I'm going to bring Simon in a moment around some of the communication stuff. But I, I think some of it is also about what you're describing is why we need can-do health and care. You know, we need that can-do. Um, certainly when I've... You know, my frustrations when trying to support my mum, for example, is trying to almost explain to her why it is that we, we go to some lengths to try and access what we need in one place. And she'll say to me, you know, this is how I, th I thought you knew about how health and care worked. And I, I'm no better off than anybody else. You're right. You know, you seem to come... I think we waste a lot of energy in sometimes people marking out what they're not going to do rather than what they are going to do. And, you know, I think that's as frustrating for professionals sometimes as well, that, you know, none of us come into health and care. Um, you know, we, we come into it because we want to be can-do. We want to be able to help and support people. And, um, and no one can do that alone in health and care. No one individual clinician can meet everybody's needs. We just need to be able to see how things can be interconnected. And to go back to the kind of complexity point, that's why you need to provide platforms for everything down to integrated teams where perhaps in a very local community um, and I'd, I'd really suggest that future you maybe talk to colleagues for example Maddie and some of the fantastic work around Ipswich and East Suffolk around bringing very local integrated teams where you've got people from the acute trust and community and mental health and so on all working together around a very local neighborhood because you know actually able to kind of um, talk about you know together about how they can between them meet the needs of individual people and families so I think some of this is about enabling everybody to do that organic job of connecting everything up and taking away, I think, what have previously been a lot of the barriers to enabling that to happen. Um, the other thing I was just going to say, I was kind of silent about the comms bit, is that um, around dentistry, one of the really refreshing things I'm really excited about is around our integrated care partnership. We're now going to have um, dentistry as a profession, clinical profession around the table. Um, as part of the membership for the first time. We've not had that until now. Um, so in actual fact, the diversity of perspectives that we've been able to bring through with the partnership, I think, will ma make sure that we are, we're not forgetting parts of the system, that all of those parts of the system are um, there and we're thinking about um, you know, wider potential and not expecting one person to represent a huge diversity of views. So from my perspective, it's about telling stories, putting across people's perspectives and experiences, listening to people about their experiences of accessing services and sharing their views. And I think if you look at the COVID pandemic, there, there were very, very, very few positives that came out of the COVID pandemic, if any at all, but one perhaps strong um, piece of, of positivity, if, if I can describe it as that, was that actually if you look at our system and many other systems across the country, how they all work together. And if I look at it from a communications perspective, we shared each other's channels, we amplified each other's messages, we helped each other and supported each other as a team of professionals. And that allowed us to reach a much greater audience to get into those truly sort of local communities as well, to amplify those messages, you know, the importance of getting vaccinated, where those vaccination clinics are, etc. So if you look at that as an example, we're going to have, through this arrangement, 
that stronger access to, to our channels, to each other's channels, and to work as a, as a much sort of more close-knit um, profession locally to serve our communities. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Maybury. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I do have some comments, and, and I think perhaps this, this may be a private conversation for me to have with um, Simon, if I may, because I have lots, lots of experiences that were not good before my husband died um, from services from the NHS. Um, there is a phrase, I could write a book on it, and I could. So I think we, there may be time for a private conversation. Um, that I could share those experiences, which um, on the whole were not really not good. Um, but coming back to what we have been hearing today, I'm going to quote Her Majesty the Queen from her Jubilee message, which was, people matter. And I think this is actually bringing back into perspective that people matter, and below the digital stuff, below the paperwork, people matter, and we need to focus on people. And if we can do that, I think that is half the exercise. So talking about people matter, we also need to raise the fact that there are more residents in this part of the world than there ever were. And in my own ward, um, and just slightly around it, I have 2,000 homes coming in the next few years. Now that could be anything from 4,000 people upwards. So what I'm trying to say is that we need actually more facilities. How are we going to get those when it is very apparent that there is a shortage of GPs to start off with, there's a shortage of dentists, there's a shortage of other NHS professional workers. How are we going to do this? Now, I'm part of the Buildston Health Centre Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're very well aware that they have already decreed that what they are one GP down and the way they are going to work is going to differ. Now I'm all for, up for supporting them and saying how can we help and I need to have that conversation with them that I've been away. Um, but what we need to get down to is how, and I'm repeating, I think, and I'm sorry if I'm getting this wrong, Councillor Richards and Councillor um, Sowers' comments, we, we need to know how this is going to work, how you're going to attract all this new staff, and I will quote um, relatives who are, and I can't tell you who they are, relatives who are in the medical profession, which is, this area is not always attractive to come to work to because our communications are poor, and I am talking about um, highways because, and I know somebody before has criticised me for this comment, but, and I say this in the nicest of ways, the medical profession, they work jolly hard, full stop, but they also play hard, i.e. when they're not at work, they want to be able to travel easy, uh, um, they need to be able to have the attractions on their door for them to have downtime, and that's what I mean by playing hard. So how are we going to do it? This sounds absolutely brilliant. Do not get me wrong, and my experience when I share it, you will understand why I think it's going to be so much better. But we've really got to have this joined up thinking that we need to attract the staff we need to put infrastructure in before we keep attracting new residents to our area. And I hope my colleagues are all listening from the other councils here. We need to be doing this at the same time. But how are we going to attract the staff? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maybury. Um, who, who would like, would you, Amanda? Thank you very much, Chair. And I completely concur with every point you've made. We don't have a, a magic bullet, a simple answer, but we do share your philosophy. And through the way that we have worked and how we continue to work with all of our system partners, the recruitment and the retention of everybody that we employ 
is of paramount importance. We have a people plan which is going to be updated and refreshed because we are very much cognizant of the fact that we need to be attracting good, high quality, high caliber people to our system. We need to recruit, but equally, we need to be making sure that we retain. And we need to be doing things very differently in terms of what is going to make our system different to other systems so that we can not only grow our own staff, but develop our current and future workforce, make them want to stay, have that sense of belonging, and working with our local education providers and our health and care academies, as well as schools. So it's really working at every dimension across the system that we are working at the moment. We want to be the best. We're not going to be there overnight, but we do have the ambition and we do need to be doing things very differently if we are going to be retaining not only our current workforce, but our future workforce. We work very closely with our Integrated Care Academy at the University of Suffolk. That's a year in place. We need to be working much more closely with that academy as we move forward. So everything you've said, Councillor Maybury, I concur with, and that's at the heart of our ambition. We have, over the coming months, got to produce and want to actually refresh our people plan so that we come up with an integrated care system for our workforce in totality. And that will be crossing not only health, but care, and including the voluntary sector as well. So we have no magic solution at the moment, but we certainly have the ambition, and it's building on the work that we have done thus far as a system. Um, <clears throat> if it, yes, if you could um, make it brief. I, I will you. make it brief. I'm, I'm going to ask all four of you sitting there whether you will support my call that for infrastructure to be put in from the councils and to try and lobby the councils as well to get the infrastructure put in now rather than later. Thank you. Can I put that to you? Um, is this um, more a matter actually for the planning um, department on behalf of the NHS? It would be interesting to understand how that works as well. I, I think what Councillor Maybury's done beautifully is highlighted the important role that our district and borough councils have in the integrated care system. So they need to be full partners in the ICS and um, particularly what you're highlighting is that importance of thinking at place. So when we're talking about we need to be thinking about specific places and what's happening in particular places and so on, this is why it's so important that we have everybody around the table and we have really good relationships. You know, we've really learned during the pandemic that it's those relationships that enable us to be fleet of foot, you know, get moving and talk about the really important things going on. Um, so um, I think you've done that really, really well and I absolutely endorse everything that you say. Thank you. Um, would anyone like to add anything? Um, otherwise I'll move on. And, um, and also, we're <clears throat> we've just about got to the end of our allotted time for this agenda item. And I'm just wondering, um, how much more have you got? Have you got a lot more? Just a little bit, but um, we, we can skip through that very quickly. It depends on how much more um, the, 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 you know, the group would like to hear. So um, shall I just skip through the last bits and then see? If, 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 if you could um, go through fairly, fairly rapidly. I mean, this is such an important item. I don't want to, um, to not have all the information that you've brought. And, and I think everyone needs a proper opportunity to ask questions. So if our next, um, if um, Mr. Brown there doesn't mind waiting a little bit. Um, please go ahead. Okay, so very quickly, um, Councillor So was ahead earlier on when she said about the brain, because I, I did say I had a picture of a brain. So it is the ICP, which is about um, you know, really leading the system around thinking differently. And thinking differently is being about being genuinely strategic and picking up on Councillor Maybury's point, it's about thinking about that, you know, that needs assessment for the population, thinking about health wellbeing strategy and all of that being built in, learning as the system as we go along. We've certainly learned a lot from the pandemic, for example, but there's many, many other areas. It's about that can do, um, you know, the points that you've raised about, you know, the importance of making sure that wherever you are through clinical professional networks, we start to really get people to feel they, they, they've got that can-do spirit. And also 
um, that local emphasis at place as well. So all of those things are a part of thinking differently as a system. So just finally, um, there's a, just a couple of slides about the role of provider collaboratives, which you'd asked for specifically in your question. So Karen's going to go through that. Thank you, Susanna. So just very briefly, we've got a slide there just setting out very clearly what a provider collaborative is. So it's at least two trusts working together at scale. Um, so it doesn't necessarily um, need legislation or, or kind of a, a stick to happen necessarily. There are lots of um, very simple ways actually providers are looking at across our patches at working together. Um, so we've listed some national examples there, but a very good example is corporate services bringing together, you know, the HR, the back office function of the different trusts and just trying to work it picks up on uh, Councillor Robinson's point earlier around the administration. Um, so very much I think provider collaboratives are looking at ways to streamline and work together um, for the common aim. Moving to the next slide, um, it isn't new. Um, our organisations do all work together in, in some form or, or other, um, but the Health and Care Act does bring together uh, different ways that they can now make joint decisions and it's very much trying to encourage that. So one way um, it's being encouraged is by um, providing that um, acute and mental health services are now expected to be part of a collaborative. So before it was kind of encouraged, but now they're, they're expected to be part of a collaborative and work together. Um, so just what does that mean on our patch here? So um, NSFT obviously is across the both um, counties. Um, they're working in an East of England provider collaborative and there's just some more information there about the things that they've um, been participating in. Uh, and then um, in Norfolk and Waveney um, are three acute trust hospitals there, um, the Paget, um, NNN and the Queen Elizabeth have formed a Norfolk and Waveney hospitals group. Um, they meet together in a committees in common to, to kind of take joint decisions and they're looking at those kind of ways that they can work more closely together. Um, so in particular, they've looked at shared policies um, and um, the urology services there across the trust, they're working at trying to work together on that. Um, so this is all very helpful as well with our waiting lists and things like that, just trying to look to see where hospitals can work together. There's still a lot more work to do um, with our um, hospitals group, mm -hmm. but I think it's great, you know, they're around the table and they're looking at these things. Um, and then we've got a um, community provider. So although the community services side aren't required to actually form that uh, collaborative, they are looking at um, how they can work closer together in, in um, Norfolk and Waveney. And there's just a section there on, on what's happening with Suffolk and, and North East Essex. Um, so Susanna is just gonna take us through the key issues. So just some final next steps. So one of the questions I anticipate you might ask is that we've got all of these different organs, all these different ways of working around the system. How do we make sure that they're kind of coordinated properly and they work well together? So um, that is an issue that um, uh, we're, we're very focused on at the moment is now we're embedding these new ways of working, um, making sure that we're very clear about the different role of different parts of the system, um, their leadership, how they work together, and uh, just to say there is a, a kind of a, a join up between the executives of these different parts of the system as well. Um, another question you might ask is about the role of our health and wellbeing boards and how that will relate to the ICS going forward. And, and we see the health and wellbeing boards as absolutely key um, as a specific organ, if you like, of the system. So if you think about you know, this little diagram um, of, of a person with different proportions is that these are there's a fantastic uh, piece of work Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, uh, pointed out, if you like, the extent to which our health and well-being outcomes as human beings are influenced by different things. So in fact, our health and care only influences about 20% of our health and well-being outcomes. Our health behaviours, the physical environment we live in, and socio-economic factors all drive our health and well-being outcomes as, as people. So it's the job of our health and well-being boards to look at those outcomes for the whole population and they still have that statutory role to put in place a joint strategic needs assessment, which is that kind of analysis of, of the need of the whole population, if you like, to achieve the best health and well-being. And again, that overall joint health and well-being strategy for the population, which absolutely will point out issues around health and care, but equally will point out what's important around education, communities, crime, housing, environment, economy. All of these things are important around people's health and well-being. 
So, if you like, the Health and Wellbeing Board is incredibly important because, in actual fact, it's where, if you like, health and care can sit at the table, but alongside, you know, stakeholders from those other areas. So, it's really exciting to be able to sit across, for example, from colleagues from the Chamber of Commerce or from education or environment or the local economic partnership and so on to actually talk about, if you like, big picture, what is influencing health and wellbeing for our population. And, you know, obviously, um, there, in each of those areas, there are uh, strategies and so on. And we want to make sure all of those are mindful of health and wellbeing. And then, of course, there's an integrated care partnership. If you like, we're very focused on health behaviours and health and care in particular. But also, we're very well aware of the fact that we can make a contribution more widely in health and care to the economy and so on. So we're thinking about our role as anchor institutions and how, you know, in actual fact, we spend money, how, you know, we put, we put in place buildings, all of the different things that we do um, in um, uh, uh, communities as health and care partners as well. So the Health and Wellbeing Board basically will, will own, uh, if you like, that, that JSNA and Joint Health Wellbeing Strategy and really have that broad focus on everything, all of the wider determinants of health, whereas the integrated care system really would help to inform that and see from a kind of health and care sector specific um, perspective, um, if you like, the contribution that we can make around those wider determinants. Last but not least, I just want to mention uh, Waveney in particular, because one of the things that we've been really keen to do to work together with Norfolk and, and, and Waveney ICS is to make sure that as two ICSs, um, we're both very focused on um, making sure that um, Waverley actually um, has, has you know, the benefit of both systems focus. So we have been doing some work, which perhaps we come back and talk about another time, about specifically you know, areas where we can join up and make sure that we, we are thinking particularly about that important um, part of the Suffolk community. Um, next steps, um, I've already mentioned, you know, we're, obviously all of this stuff um, is getting going now, and that at a glance guide and joined up executives we mentioned earlier on that there's some guidance still emerging. The Department of Health and Social Care is expected to publish guidance on integrated care partnerships and that integrated care strategy any day now in July. Um, and we need to work quickly together to develop that first integrated care strategy for the end of the year. That will then drive the development of NHS integrated care board plans for April 2023. And the other thing to bear in mind, as I mentioned on the way through, that there is an integration white paper that was published in February. So that is still working its way through as well, and that really offers another layer of um, legislation which I think is important in driving places. Last but not least, um, we work together. So um, there are a number of areas of common interest between Norfolk and Waveney, ICS and Suffolk and North East Essex. Um, in particular, mental health, um, what we can do for our more particularly coastal um, deprived communities where we've, we've got some, um, some examples of work um, that, we, that have been had, have, particularly at place level, that we think we could extend further. And another kind of really big ambition across both the ICSs has been increasingly um, the role of voluntary community sector um, in integrated care systems. And in fact, both systems are known nationally um, as exemplary in that area. So I'm going to stop there because I'm aware of time, Chair, but happy to take any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, does anyone have any final questions? I've got a couple myself. Um, Councillor Sola. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm very pleased you're taking the well-being into your, into your sort of um, future aims very much because they are likely then to prevent actually illnesses as well. That's very good. Um, well, I have in the end three points to raise. So I am very much aware that you can't change the pay scale for a nurse, but are you going to lobby for better pay for nurses, given that a nurse who just finished her degree, her starting salary is 25,000 pounds, which is very, very low. Um, and you, Amanda, said you would like to attract and keep high qualified personnel. So I think, are you going to lobby for higher pay, even though you can't change this pay scale yet. Um, the other thing is, um, are you going to streamline equipment? For example, 
um, let's say, the ECG dots of paramedics are completely different than in some trusts used. So you have to change them over, which is, of course, not only an additional cost for equipment, but, of course, it's um, environmentally mm -hmm. absolutely absurd that you have to throw away the ECG dots. Patients come in from the ambulance, and you have to put on new ones. So it's a cost and environmental factor. The third one is... Personally, and this goes to Simon, I mean, I would not talk about organs. I mean, it is, there are lots of um, things you could criticize on where is the blood going to oxygenate the organs, or like where is the heart, what happens when, valve, when the valve is sort of not working properly anymore. Um, and, and to think of organs, some of our sort of people living in Essex and Suffolk might actually think, Bleh. so they might actually think this is a sort of a little bit awkward um, comparison. So maybe for communication to people in Suffolk, Essex and wherever, I would personally, I would not talk about organs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can we have a response to those three? Just to say, I'll take responsibility. In fact, the, the the description of organs comes from me, and it's not what we've used in our public um, sort of you know, genuine communications. It's more about thinking as a system, because the thing is that actually the thing that's held us back is actually having kind of you know um, you know health and care is very organic. You've got to enable everyone to kind of be able to do something very slightly different for everybody. So what we're trying to do is just try and bring about that idea of a system rather than kind of, you know, a structure. But what happens if you can take one kidney away and you can take a few bits of the liver away? <laughs> so it is a little bit of a tricky thing because then you can, you are open up for criticism quite quickly. But it's up to you. I mean, that's just my personal choice. Thank you. Point taken. So I think um, maybe it'd be helpful for uh, Amanda. Do you want to address both the net zero and the um, uh, workforce point? Indeed. Thank you very much, Susanna. So thank you very much for your two really helpful questions and challenges. So if I take the pay one first, there is no simple answer, but yes, in short. Now, the NHS has traditionally and will continue to work with the national pay review bodies and our respective trade unions. So that is an ongoing dialogue and conversation and it really is quite intense what we do at the moment and I think in simple answer to your question we will continue to do all of that and more. We've made it very clear thus far on our staff's feelings on the national pay framework, our trade unions continue to lobby, region, national NHS and government so it's a continuation and I think the trick going forward is that we are able to apply science and methodology to our argument and backing up the case with real life examples and stats will, in my view, only influence and hopefully get a better outcome as we move forward. So in terms of then the streamlined recruitment and picking up the sustainability digital agenda, absolutely. And I think we do need to be looking differently at our way, the way we currently recruit and I think we should personally be streamlining to make it more attractive, more pragmatic and more solution focused because at the moment we have multiple ways of recruitment which is cumbersome and complicated and perhaps too excessive in terms of time frame. So I think as a system and as we mature and evolve we need to be better at coming together and looking at efficient and effective ways of recruitment that ultimately streamline how we recruit and ultimately how we retain our workforce going forward. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just while we're <clears throat> sort of in the conclusion mode, um, I'm aware we've got um, our cabinet member, Councillor um, Andrew Reid in the back and um, also Andy Yacoub with Health Watch. And I just wonder if either of you would like to pop in a quick question. Thank you. No, it's been very uh, informative and instructive to um, hear how the um, uh, committee has actually uh, gone about asking their questions. And it's been very helpful for me to understand how we might develop uh, a regular 
uh, um, discussion with you about the progress that we uh, are hoping to make over the next year or so. So uh, I won't make any further comment at this stage, but um, we'll, if I may, uh, Chair, uh, discuss with you how, how we might do that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would welcome that. And um, Andy, would you like to have a, any quick comment or question? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's not a question. It's just a very, very briefly some, um, some thoughts about what's been presented and, and some of the really, really interesting and um, challenging questions that have come from the, the committee. Um, ultimately, this, is, this has come down through law, uh, through statute, and uh, it's about how each system across the country is interpreting uh, that law. Uh, and what um, I'm really encouraged by is the fact that in Suffolk and North East Essex, we had a system of collaboration that was already in existence, and that's helping pave the way to interpreting that law as best as we can, bearing in mind there's going to be less money, and bearing in mind we know we're going to struggle in, in keeping the workforce um, uh, up to uh, whatever it is that can, it can potentially be. Um, in terms of the Waveney area, I'm delighted in that we're going to be involved with the Health and Wellbeing Partnership in the Waveney area specifically. I'm really glad that that's now being constructed because originally I think there were just going to be the five places uh, and it was going to be a great Yarmouth and Waveney uh, uh, aspect to the sort of geography. Um, and we will also be observers on the um, ICB in, in that area, in that system. Norfolk and Waveney had a, 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 um, a voluntary community sector um, assembly already in place, uh, and Emma was mentioned earlier, and I'm also delighted that we're going to have something similar for Suffolk and North East Essex. Um, ultimately, uh, it, it's who said it's the, gonna, the proof is going to be in, the, in eating the pudding. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we're here as a health watch, and our colleagues in Essex and Norfolk are here to be those independent bodies that have a statutory role uh, in holding people like yourselves, who are good people like yourselves, to account when we need to, but also to congratulate you when you're, when you're, when you're achieving what it is you're setting out to achieve. And you really have some high ambitions, um, but it is a long journey, um, and not all the people's experiences are going to be uh, good. Uh, there, there are going to be difficulties, and that's where we learn uh, the most. Just last point, and it was really quite interesting, I think it was Councillor Richards was saying that um, where does social care come into all of this? I think it's a, it's a, a conception that uh, a, a lot of the public have, that this is, because it's NHS driven, um, it, it is about the NHS, but the whole idea is that the NHS can't fix the problems that we have on its own. Uh, and it's been seeking the help of uh, other agencies. And for more, more and more uh, are, being, are being involved. And the Integrated Care Partnership for Suffolk and North East Essex is a really good example of when you do look at the list of members on there, that is about as broad as you're going to get anywhere in the country. Um, so um, I'm, my glass is half full. Great, thank, thank you so much. Um, just while we wrap up, I, I just noticed a couple of the questions in our paper that um, maybe um, I would seek a direct answer to, and this will be really short, sort of yes or no. Um, <clears throat> a number K on page 18. Um, who are the ICBs accountable to? Perhaps you could clarify that. To NHS England. Sorry? NHS England. And um, does the, um, I suppose, is there any connection between, for instance, us here and NHS England? Is there any um, route of communication? So, uh, could you ask for a is, is there any communication avenue between, <clears throat> I suppose, what I'm talking about? the local authority, HW Health and Wellbeing Board, HOSC, which is representing, in this case, Suffolk, and NHS England? Um, I think that's a good question. I mean, 
I mean, certainly, I mean, for, um, I mean, HOSC, I mean, I mean, Ultimately, it, the NHS ICB is a statutory NHS body which basically must be accountable to NHS England. Um, but, um, it, you know, you could be observers. I mean, we've asked NHS England to be a partner around the table in our integrated care partnership. Um, and also, I think that HOSC would want to be regular observers of the work of the integrated care partnership. Um, and um, uh, also, there's, I think, some work to be done in terms of the role that NHS England will have in systems or with systems going forward. I'm not entirely sure what that will be. I'm not sure, if Claire, Karen, if you're any clearer on that yet. Um, I think that it's still in development. There's going to be um, overview, oversight by NHS England. We're not quite clear on the kind of exact mechanism of that yet, but there will, there will be something, I'm sure. Um, and um, yeah, I think as well, the other thing is that our meetings will be held in public, so there will be a um, transparency and public accountability as well in that in the decision making. Um, so um, again, via Health Watch being observed, formal observers at the meeting, there are different ways that I think you know you will come to hear around around things as well. Thank you very much. Um, on um, item O. Um, I, I do need to ask this question. <clears throat> um, are there any potential service changes or transformation programs that are coming up which we should be aware of um, in connection with these changes? So, so we need to do the work on our strategy, our integrated care strategy over the next few months. But the one that I think, um, and it might be a good one to, to leave you on, is that um, with the whole diversity of partners around the table in the ICS, it, there are obviously new opportunities. So one that we are exploring at the moment with voluntary community social enterprise sector partners are, you know, where is it possible for some of those partners to work together and perhaps to be more involved with delivery um, uh, th from the NHS? Where can we invest more with those sector partners? And I have to say one of the things I think we're blessed with, one of the biggest assets in Suffolk, is the fact we've got a very strong voluntary community sector and I think um, uh, the transformation might be is seeing those partners as much more central to the way in which um, care is delivered going forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think um, that sort of completes this item um, and you know this has been really really interesting and relevant to all of us. Um, I think the reorganisation um, that we've seen is probably, it's so complicated, but it's probably the only way to bring about the kind of changes that I think we've all felt for years and needed. And I, mean, I personally absolutely welcome it. And, you know, we're on this journey together and, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I think it will be, it, be exciting. So thank you again very much. Um, I'm just wondering, does anyone want a really quick bathroom break? Um, because I, I could use one. Should we reconvene in, um, in five minutes? Is that, by my watch, that is um, <clears throat> 12.52.
Um, good morning again. Um, we're going to we're reconvening the meeting, and um, we are going on to agenda item seven, <coughs> which is an update on the use of Hartismere Health and Care Centre um, in I. And I'll hand over now to um, David Brown, who is the Deputy Chief Operating Officer for NHS Suffolk and North East Essex. Um, David, the stage is yours. Uh, brilliant. Good morning. I uh, hope you didn't mind me coming down here. I was originally due to be there, but I thought I'd stop you all craning your necks. <laughs> Um, I was supposed to be accompanied by a gentleman called Daniel Turner, who's our head of estates, but he's uh, poorly today, so I'm afraid you've just got me. And uh, what was fascinating listening to the previous four speakers was the breadth and the strategy and all the rest of it. Um, I'm just here to talk to you about one small building in one corner of Suffolk, so my apologies that we've gone from that to that, but it's important nevertheless. So. Uh, the plan is that I'll brief you on the, the current position and the, the chairman had asked for an update uh, in terms of where we're at and, and uh, in particular utilisation. And um, uh, I was set uh, four questions, I think, which hopefully I'm going to answer uh, over the next few minutes. Hopefully, chairman, I'll be able to catch some of your time up, so uh, I don't think we'll need the full half hour. Um, anyway, there's a picture for those of you who haven't been to I to look at Hartismere. It's a brilliant building. I know most of you have heard me say this before, but uh, I've worked in various bits of rural NHS around the country. Um, the first time I went, I was expecting a tatty old building uh, that was on its last legs, and I was amazed because it obviously had an excellent refurbishment. I don't know if you've all been, but if you haven't, I would encourage you to go and have a look. It, it, it really is a, an excellent facility. And uh, I pinched this from somebody else's presentation because I haven't got a photo of it, but I thought always good to remind, remind ourselves. Um, uh, so the, um, but I need to go back. One of the questions I was asked was um, who's responsible for uh, Hartsmere Health, Health and Care? Um, the building is owned and managed by NHS Property Services, which is a, an organisation set up by NHS England about, say, 12, 15 years ago, and it owns an awful lot of the, the estate ac across England and Wales. Um, they own it, and they then uh, lease it out to, to various tenants, nearly all of whom are uh, NHS tenants. Um, our role, and when I say CCG, my apologies, I've worked for the CCG for eight years, so we've, we've only been an ICB for a, for a week. Uh, so when I say CCG, I mean ICB. Uh, so our role as an ICB is um, uh, that we have this overall responsibility for planning, strategy and so on, which was fairly eloquently explained by colleagues earlier. Um, but the, uh, one of those aspects, which was a part of how uh, property service was set up, is if there is any void space within a, a building, uh, we pick up the costs for that. It was um, part of the underpinning arrangements for NHS property services. Um, so we're obviously interested for a number of reasons in terms of, in terms of how it works. Um, Next is, these are the services that are currently delivered, principally on the ground floor. Um, I'm not going to read to you, got, mainly because my eyesight's got to the stage where I need glasses for here, and I'm struggling to read there. But anyway, okay. Um, the, uh, one of the things we wanted to pull out, which we thought would be useful, is there's a perception that it's um, uh, very, very underutilised. Now, when you go, uh, can I just ask how many people haven't been? Now, I'll do the haven't been on the premise that, all right, okay. So, all right, okay, I, th I thought it'd be the other way around. Um, for those who have been, when you go, it feels quiet, and unless you get it on a particularly uh, busy day. They do a uh, some screening clinics there, and I've been there once, and I thought, wow, what's happened? The place is buzzing. But, um, uh, but generally, it feels quiet. 
And what these statistics show, sorry, uh, net internal area is the, the inside of the box rather than the outside of the box. It's something that the estates team use. Um, so the hospital uh, uh, occupy a significant amount of the clinical space on the ground floor. County Council have got quite a bit of the admin space. Uh, allied health professionals, and, and they're, they're basically a physiotherapy, I think they're the biggest physiotherapy provider in Suffolk, and I'm going to come on to them uh, towards the end of my brief presentation. They also use quite a lot of the space in the main building. Um, uh, Norfolk Community, they've got some space, although not a great deal. And then there is other pieces of other space that people can book into for ad hoc services. So the bit that I wanted to particularly pull out is that final paragraph. So the vacant space, i.e. that that's not permanently allocated, is 16.5%. Uh, yeah, if I'm reading it right. Um, uh, most of it is on the upper floors, and they're the admin uh, floors rather than the clinical space. And I think that it's the reason we wanted to put these statistics up is it, it kind of dispels slightly you've got this enormous building that's not terribly well utilised. Now, I, I do appreciate there's a difference between an organisation has got the rights to use that section as to whether they're actually using it uh, 10 sessions a week. Um, okay. Uh, if you're at the stage of the eyesight that I'm at, you might struggle with the next few slides. I hadn't realised it would be quite whatever. But that's the overall site. Um, the bit etched in blue or purple, whatever it is, uh, is, is the site that we're talking about. And off to the right, as you look at it, or as I look at it, uh, is there's a building that's not etched, which is called the Lodge, and I want to talk about that in a moment. Further right is the, the GP surgery, and then to the bottom of that slide is the, uh, there's a care home that's not shown on that particular diagram. Uh, ah, right, okay. Um, you can't see this that clearly, but if you read from the bottom, which I know is slightly counterintuitive, that's the ground floor, then there's the first floor in the middle, and then the, the, the top floor, uh, the second floor is the very top bit there. And, and the, the legend down the side demonstrates who's in which bit. Um, are these slides in the, the pack of information that members of the committee have had? Yeah. What, what, what is they haven't been circulated to everybody, because I think the version we got was draft. It, it was. Th this bit's the same. But, but if, Teresa, is it OK if we circulate? We, so, we, we will, we'd love to have the, the, the slides in circulation. Yeah, Thank that, you. that'll be great. Uh, the front is the top. Uh, <laughs> the, the photo, if you take it that the photo I put up was the front, um, but, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, my apologies. You come in at the top of the diagram on, e on each one. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on. But it, but it shows who's using what and, and the, the, un the, the unused elements. So the, the element I wanted to talk about um, was how we might utilise it further, because that's the, the, the constant debate we have around Artismere. And um, uh, I mentioned there's an organisation called Allied Health Professionals who are basically a very large physiotherapy provider. And um, they've approached us, so we're having discussions with them, about some accommodation that they use in the lodge. So the lodge is, as you look at the front of it, to your left. Uh, and they, they share some, that, some of that building with the police, which is an unlikely mix, but apparently works really well. Um, and uh, they've also got some accommodation uh, in the, the, the main building. And what they'd like to do is move out of the lodge into the main building. So we're really quite supportive of that as an ICB, and to choose my initials correctly there. Um, and that, that will improve the utilisation significantly. Um, uh, excuse me one moment. Um, uh, assuming that this goes ahead, uh, this will leave uh, 60 square metres unutilised in the main building. I think you might have got a question. 
Yes, Councillor Mabry. If I may, um, Chairman. Um, yes, my, my question is, um, are the upper floors accessible by lift or is it all staircase looking uh, at the building? They're, they're, they're accessible by both lift and staircases. Some yeah. of you may know the story about the lift. Anybody? No? Okay, I won't. Uh, I won't. Yeah, we, we, we yeah, will um, we'll, we'll park that story. We'll, we'll, we'll do that another day. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's accessible by lift and, uh, and there's stairs uh, in, in various places because it's quite a long, thin building. Um, so the conversation that we're having with allied health professionals is about them moving from the lodge uh, completely into the main building, which will increase the utilisation significantly. It, it will require uh, some of the services that are provided by ESNEF, so Ipswich Hospital, uh, to share some accommodation and those conversations are happening at the moment so we're, we're fairly optimistic that that will uh, improve the utilisation it hasn't been agreed by the ICB yet um, uh, but I can't see a reason why it wouldn't be but I, I do want to stress you know what the governance process is like of large organisations so this is a proposal at the minute rather than something that's agreed but I, I thought it would be helpful if you were able to see to see that. Um, oh, sorry, I've gone too far. Apologies for that. Um, so I'm proposing to stop there, Chairman, uh, and if there were any questions, I would obviously try and answer them. Um, I'll open it up for questions now. I'm Councillor Flatman. Um, yes, David. Have you thought about utilising it a little bit more by having a mental health hub there? Um, we're desperate in the rural areas to have, especially with um, teenagers and children, the lack of um, any facility, and that would be an ideal local f for a lot of villages around that area. Yeah, so um, we, we, we keep looking at any opportunity that, that, that comes along, and, and I know we've looked at can we do that. Um, so th nothing's uh, off, off, off the, off the off consideration. Um, one of the issues that relates to those sorts of services and any of the others is the population of I and the surrounding villages is relatively small relative to the rest of the population of Suffolk. Um, and we always get into a, a discussion about the, um, how often clinics would take place and how, and how often could they be filled. So just to reassure the committee that um, all the options that, that we can, uh, Hartismere is, 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 you know, one of the questions is, oh, can we use Hartismere for that, for that purpose? And um, whatever comes along, whatever's been discussed, uh, I'm a great advocate for the building going, can we use Hartismere for that? They say one of the biggest issues that's a barrier is the population in that area is relatively small. A lot of high schools now are having a practitioner, a GP, go in and talk to them, you know, have, have um, one-to-ones just to see, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic, a lot of um, students, I know this as a teacher, um, they are very um, withdrawn from other years, previous years, right. it's teenagers especially, because they've spent so much time on their phones um, and, and, you know, and not conversing properly. Um, or stuck in front of a, a Xbox, that um, you know we, we greatly we are seeing need, um, and I'm just thinking if you take in all the rural areas around um, I, you know there are a lot a lot of villages that um, would have to travel some way, um, especially with fuel prices etc. Yeah, no. um, and sometimes these are families that perhaps can't afford that travel. Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll raise that issue again, say that there's, there's no ideas that, that we won't consider. Um, ideally, mental health services, like lots of other services, need to be delivered as close to people's homes as they can. So, um, but, but yeah, we can certainly consider that. Thank you. That's, that's a really good point. And I think <clears throat> I'd like us to, um, to follow that up because um, I, I think... Um, you know, while rural areas don't necessarily have the density of numbers of towns, 
um, that doesn't mean they don't have need. And um, the need um, is, is more difficult to meet because of, of travel and things. But, but it doesn't mean to say <clears throat> it shouldn't be met. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a great, as, as a rural person myself, I, I think that we must overcome that barrier, just the, the fact that, um, that there's less volume and therefore less, um, you know, <clears throat> maybe, maybe less, less of a f positive financial model and um, less of a, at least an, an initial argument for, for responding to the need. So um, let, let's definitely follow that up. I think rural transport is something that we are looking at um, at district level, and um, it's something that is certainly not insoluble. Um, I'd just like to put in a quick question on that point uh, myself while I have the opportunity. What, um, if anything, is the NHS doing to work more closely with DIS? And we know our colleagues in Norfolk. Uh, in respect of heart, isn't it? Um, we, we've had conversations with colleagues in Norfolk about how might we increase the catchment area and the utilisation. Um, uh, that they were supportive of the idea, but they've got exactly the same issue. Uh, uh, there's a similar set of circumstances in Thetford, and uh, they're looking to uh, increase the utilisation of the, the facility there. So, um, the when we had that conversation, there wasn't a lot of interest in, in, in taking that further. Okay, thank you. I mean, Thetford is quite away from my particularly. It, it is. Um, but, but you know, the parts of Suffolk that are sort of to the east of Dis, and I just, I just think we might want to keep that alive as well. Yes, and it's got, a, it's got a high school too. So just something to keep in mind. Um, que question, Margaret, Margaret, Councillor Mabry, did you have a question? Yes, um, I was just going to um, support what um, Councillor Flatman was, um, was actually saying about the proximity of um, services, um, especially for, for mental health services because it's, um, it's a known fact, isn't it, that um, y our young people are more likely to die at the age of 13 now through suicide than anything else, which is absolutely horrifying for me as a mother and a grandmother to, to understand. And also the, the situation where, where cost of living is hitting pockets and that I understand it costs a family about £31 to take a child to a hospital visit. So anything that we can have closer to where they live would be really, really useful and helpful. Um, so I hope that will be taken on board. But I support what Councillor Flatman is, is saying, that if we can get um, the mental health for our young people closer to home, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So can, can I make two, two, response, two points in response? So um, I think generally the NHS is trying to provide more services closer to people, not just mental health, where they live, for, for some of the reasons you've said and others. Um, the other thing is um, ne next time you have NSFT sat here, then it might be worth addressing some of those points to them and say we, we'd happily facilitate uh, the utilisation of Hartismere. Um, if, if they uh, were able to, to put the staff in there. Great, thank you. Councillor um, Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just sort of, this is linking up in my mind, I've never been to Hartispear, but um, in my ward in North West Ipswich, we have what's now the Unity Centre. Um, and I think the funding for that, there was big funding for it to support the um, uh, work of voluntary groups, particularly in the area of Bane, the Bane population. And I think the money came from a particular uh, pot. Um, is it an issue here? My question is, is this an issue of funding more than anything else? And I'm just drawing on the previous comments and questions about transport and that if there were funding that had, 
I don't know, a bus that brought people from particular villages or and that sort of thing and linking up with rural transport. Um, is that a way forward? Um, potentially. So th there isn't a financial issue per se in terms of the building. So the, the building costs are covered through a variety of mechanisms. Um, uh, there's a perennial issue in terms of NHS and paying for transport to services um, that I'm sure you, this committee's probably addressed previously. Um, and there's a set of criteria about whether patients are eligible for such uh, uh, travel support or, or not. Uh, and I know that's sometimes contentious. Um, but that, that applies to all NHS services, not just hospitals. So, so there's currently policy in place at the moment. And, it, and if patients, uh, they, they met that criteria, then they could utilise that. So I, I know that's probably not as fulsome an answer as you'd like, but there's a, there's a policy there already, I'm afraid. Thank, thank you very much. Um, any other questions from people? Um, can, can you tell us, I mean, what is the sort of longer term vision for Artismere? Is, is there one, or is it to sort of carry on with hope as we are doing now? Um, uh, we're really, we think it's a great facility. Uh, we're committed to keeping it open. Um, and I think, I think that's a really important assurance to give this committee. We want to see it utilised as fully uh, as we can do because we don't like the idea of wasted estate. And, and bizarrely, in other parts of Suffolk, we're crying out for estate. We just haven't got enough elsewhere, um, which is why we keep looking at various initiatives to, to see what work that, uh, sorry, what patient activity we can uh, undertake through that particular site. But at the moment, it is a uh, a maintenance of the status quo, and I think that's an important reassurance to give, um, and us continuing to look what else we can do out of that particular site. Thank you. I mean, I'm aware that <coughs> um, there has been effort in the past to bring primary care um, practice into the um, Hartismere Centre, and um, you know, I understand the reasons why this hasn't happened yet, but um, is there in the longer term perhaps a prospect of this happening and it forming, you know, more of a primary care hub for the local area? Um, it, it's unlikely to happen in the short and medium term, as far as I can, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, the, the plan isn't to convert Hartismere into a primary care hub for for, for those reasons, because you, you need GPs at the heart of something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll see if GPs continue to provide services out of the existing building that they're currently in. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions, then um, I think we'll probably wrap this up. And I think... <coughs> Um, the message is to, for everyone to keep trying and, and looking for ideas and possibly our participation in the um, ICP partnership may throw open some ideas as well once that gets going and um, hopefully, <coughs> um, you know, that will be the beginning of a sort of a different view to, to, to how we solve these kinds of um, dilemmas. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I've got a, a note um, on the um, request. And in, could you think you could read it? Because I'm having difficulty reading your writing. Please, sorry. Sorry about that, Chairman. Um, would the committee want to request an update on the current discussions about the um, allied health professionals moving in to the void space just to see what what's happened with that possibly for October
yeah. Is that so, something you could organise uh, for it, us? It is, as, as I mentioned in the break, yes. I'm, I actually retire in a few weeks, so it won't be me, I'm afraid, delivering that update, but I, I'm sure we can uh, uh, arrange for a, a colleague to, to provide an update, so, um, yeah. Um, and, and just finally, um, as, as you are retiring, and this is likely to be your last appearance before us, um, I would really like to thank you f for your um, willingness to talk to us and, and come and come before us and, and respond to our questions. It's been a really positive relationship, and uh, wish you luck. Um, you. <coughs> w w watch out for the um, what is it that um, flight contraption you were going to <laughs> dabble in. But um, hopefully we can um, you know have the same relationship with with the person uh, who steps uh, into your shoes. Uh, 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 I'm sure you will. So thank you very much, Chair, for those kind words. Um, can I just ask two questions of the committee and then I'll go and let you get on with the rest of your meeting. So the first one is when you've got anybody here uh, in front of you from a health perspective, just keep a question at the back of your mind and maybe ask it, uh, could, could that be delivered out of Hartismere? Because that, that might, that might be, be helpful. And then the final one is um, my, my day job isn't actually Hartismere, it's uh, I, I, uh, I deal with general practice in, in the east of Suffolk. Uh, hence, it was really quite frustrating earlier when you're asking questions about general practice not to be able to join in, but anyway. Um, so, so my request is if you could be kind to your local general practice. They're going through a huge amount at the moment. Dem demand is, is significant uh, um, and a lot of GPs and their staff are very uh, tired and so on. And uh, just a request that if you could to be kind to your local practice. And uh, wish you and your committee well, Chairman. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, message noted. Thank you. Sorry, pages 25 to 38 in our papers. And um, in particular, I'm looking at um, let's see, Appendix A is the, um, oh, that's the terms of reference for the Joint Norfolk and Suffolk um, Scrutiny Committee. I'm, I'm assuming that people have read this. Um, and um, right, I'll just go through the various items on page starting on page 25. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the Norfolk Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee, um, the committee is being asked to confirm that councillors Keith Robinson and Edward Back will continue as co-opted members, with myself and councillor. Colin Hedgley from East Suffolk acting as named substitutes. Is that correct? Is, is Councillor Hedgley available and able to fulfil this function? Okay. Um, item B <clears throat> is to agree the standard terms of reference for the Norfolk Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And this committee will examine um, NHS consultations affecting patients in both counties. Um, the terms of reference are in Appendix A. Has everyone had a chance to look at these and is satisfied with them? No comments. <coughs> Next item C. Appoint one member and up to two named substitutes to vacancies on the Suffolk and North East Essex Joint Scrutiny, Scrutiny Task and Finish Group, um, otherwise known as the SNE. And um, <clears throat> we have, let me see, myself, um, 
Chancellor Lockington. Can you help, help me out, Teresa? Who else have we got here? Um, Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, the Suffolk and North East Essex Joint Health Scrutiny Committee, the current membership is Councillors Fleming, Lockington, Soa. Uh, Councillor Margaret Marks is currently the substitute. Um, so, we are looking to fill one vacancy as a committee member and two vacancies uh, for substitutes. And Councillor Margaret Marks has um, a volunteered to take up the place on the main committee. So if the committee is happy to agree that. And I think Councillor Christine Shaw has offered to pick up a place as a substitute. Thank you, is, is that, Shaw. Thank you very much. Is that all right, Councillor? Um, I think as a substitute, you will be invited to meetings so that you know what's going on. Um, you just wouldn't be able to take a vote if one was called for. Um, the next one is to appoint one member, I better put my glasses on, to the vacancy on the West Suffolk Hospital Future Systems Programme Task and Finish Group. Um, and this group looks to West Suffolk Hospital for their acute services. Now, uh, currently this committee is chaired by Councillor Margaret Marks. And um, we also have Councillor Sower. And let's see, we've got a vacancy. I think Councillor Flatman, you had expressed an interest in it. Um, all right, um, do we have... Sorry, and three is, is sufficient. Okay, grand, we've got that. And on E, we've got to um, need to agree the nominations for a joint health education and children's services scrutiny committee task and finish group on childhood obesity. Um, this is a joint um, <coughs> group with the education and children's services scrutiny committee which um, came out of a recent meeting of that committee. It's responding to a recommendation. Um, currently, we have um, councillors Edward Back, Inga Lockington, Sandy Martin, Graham Newman, and Joanna Spicer on that um, group. Is everyone content with that membership? Obviously, we um, don't have a say on the members proposed from the Education Committee. Um, Councillor Back and, um, in her absence, Councillor Lockington, are you all right with that proposal? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we need to appoint link members um, to observe board meetings in public um, and also a health scrutiny member to sit on the um, ESNEFT Every Birth Every Day Maternity Programme Board. And um, this is set out in Appendix B, page 37. Um, so I'll just go through them. Um, we've got the, <coughs> the North East, Suffolk and North East Essex um, ICB and Primary Care Commissioning Board. Um, that, I think, is, is that me? Yes, because I've, um, you could, because I've, I've got notes scribbled down, but I'm not 100% sure they're correct. So if you could go through them, Julie, sir. Thank you. Um, so Appendix B on page 37 sets out current membership and vacancies. Um, these are not actually members to sit on the boards, but observers on behalf of this committee to observe board meetings in public. The first one is the NHS Suffolk North East Essex ICB and Primary Care Commissioning Board. That's currently a vacancy. Councillor Margaret Marks has offered to pick that one up. Um, is there any other interest? No? So if we put Councillor Marks forward for that one. 
Um, the next one is NHS Norfolk and Waveney ICB and Primary Care Commissioning Board. Now, this obviously links to the work um, Councillor Robinson and back do with the Norfolk HOSC. Um, so I don't know if one or other of you might be willing to pick that up. Councillor Robinson, thank you. And the Norfolk and Waveney Integrated Care Partnership, also Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care Partnership. Oh, that's the partnership. Councillor Fleming, is, um, are you happy to pick that one up? Um, yes. Thank you. And then finally, we've got the East Suffolk and North Essex NHS Foundation Trust Board. Currently a vacancy. Councillor Inga Lockington has volunteered to pick that one up. If, are there any other, any other interest in that one? So I agreed with Councillor Lockington. And finally, the ESNEFT Every Birth Every Day Programme Board. Again, an observer. Um, Councillor Debbie Richards has volunteered. Any other interest? Agreed for Councillor Richards to pick that one up. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll just add on that that <clears throat> observers aren't routinely notified of when these meetings take place. Um, so if you've been nominated as an observer, it is up to you to check on their websites and um, find out when they are. I think most of the meetings are still on Teams. Um, but it is, it is up to you to pull down the agendas and to, um, you know, to, to schedule your own attendance at them. And then <clears throat> report back, you know, if there's anything su substantial to report, to report back to this committee or, or send an email to Teresa and myself. Um, on that note, I think it is 12.30, so we'll take a break for lunch and reconvene in an hour. So if we could be back at half past one, that would be great. Thank you.
Hi, Kath. Can you hear me? It's Catherine Bailey. Oh. I can't hear you, though. What about now? That's good. So when the red bar is when the bar is red, does that mean my microphone is working? Sounds like it. I can hear you now. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll put the screen back on now. Cheers.
Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> um, we are now reconvening the health scrutiny meeting. And um, please ensure all microphones are turned off. <coughs> um, may I remind you that this meeting is now being broadcast live and um, is available to watch. So um, <coughs> a live session again. A recording of this part of the meeting will be available for subsequent viewing. Um, we're going to consider item nine now, the um, Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust, NSFT's, proposals for the redesignation of psychiatric intensive care units, aka PICU units, in Norfolk and Suffolk. And um, <clears throat> this item is not a scrutiny review because we do need to come to a conclusion. Um, actually, there are three asks, and these are set out on page 39, paragraph 4 in our papers. We are being asked to agree to establish a joint committee with the Norfolk Health Scrutiny Committee on setting up a task and finish group to receive formal consultation on the proposals <clears throat> because they have implications for patients in both Norfolk and Suffolk. We are being asked to nominate four members and up to two substitutes to sit on the joint committee with Norfolk. And we're being asked to ident identify any information and key lines of inquiry which we think the joint committee should consider. And, um, and those are the three focus items for this scrutiny. Um, I would now like to introduce Kath Blyford, um, who's the Chief Officer and Deputy Chief Executive for Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust. Um, Kath is joining us remotely. And um, <coughs> Kath, over to you to tell us what the proposals are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor. Can you hear me? Yes, I, we can hear. Yes. Lovely, thank you. Firstly, can I apologise for not being there in person? I've got COVID um, and I'm still within my infectious phase. So um, really for safety, it's um, the right thing to do to stay away um, and keep people safe. But thank you for giving me time on your meeting. Um, what I don't propose to do is to go through the paper in its entirety, but maybe to give some, um, uh, some snippets of information which might help the committee in considering the ask set out in the paper as you've just described, Chair. So psychiatric intensive care um, provision. Part of me um, thinks it might be sensible to describe it in similar way as um, the intensive care units that you see in the acute hospitals, the physical health units, where people go into those units when their level of need is of a particular level, um, and then they are stepped down um, back into a, um, a standard ward um, in the hospitals. And the same principle applies for psychiatric intensive care units. So the people um, whose needs escalate to the level of severe um, intensity, um, higher levels of staffing, smaller numbers of patients in the environment, um, and more specific um, care given to them because of their level of need. The idea is that the psychiatric intensive care unit beds are available for people when they need it. Um, but one of the um, things that um, is really important for us at the moment is to, um, we want to consider change in the two wards that we have. We've got one PICU ward designated in Norfolk, which is Rollsby in the Helston site in Norwich, and another ward, um, Lark Ward, which is in the Woodland site in Ipswich. Um, and clinical evidence um, and good safe practice is um, identifying that these wards should be designated as single gender um, with a perspective of focusing on safety, um, particularly physical safety, sexual safety and emotional safety um, as the main factors. But although there are other reasons why um, single gender is more preferable from a clinical management perspective. Um, <clears throat> You may not be aware, um, uh, Suffolk Hosk, but Rollsby Ward in um, Norwich has been closed for approximately a year because of 
such significant damage to the environment that it didn't need to be redecorated. It needed to be completely refurbished um, and repaired because of the scale of the damage that was done. Um, and so that now that ward has been refurbished um, and is ready, um, subject to recruitment of staff to start taking patients. And, um, and it really is the time to pick up on the issue of single gender. So the other thing I wanted to point out, which maybe isn't explicitly clear in the paper that has been shared with you so far, is even before the closure of Rollsby um, a year ago, um, we were unable to provide the safe um, care that's needed for women, predominantly women, who needed to be in a single gender environment. So prior to Rollsby closure, and of course during Rollsby's closure, uh, it means that um, the only way in which women who need um, single gender environments, which is most of the patients, um, have had to be placed in um, units elsewhere in the country because NSFT doesn't provide a single gender environment for them. So we have got women who, for, for a number of years now, have been placed all over the country um, as opposed to within um, the counties of Norfolk and Suffolk to receive their um, psychiatric intensive care provision. And the challenges associated with that is that they're not anywhere near connected to family, friends, but also the local provision to enable that step down to take place that I described earlier. So we um, are proposing um, that it is um, the safe thing to do, the appropriate thing to do to um, designate Lark Ward as a male ward and Rollsby Ward as a female ward um, in order to um, provide that safe um, evidence-based care that single gender provision of PICU is the right thing to do. So I'm happy to stop there, Chair. Um, rather than me rambling on, I'm sure people have got questions they'd rather um, ask me. Thank, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll um, take questions from the committee. Um, I just wanted to um, just reiterate the fact that um, the reason this has come to us is um, that the question is, is this a substantial change to the existing service? There is a key underlying question here. And um, I think that <clears throat> we need to take a view as a committee. Um, and on that assumption that it is, um, that would predicate setting up the joint committee to examine the issue and, and the implications of the change in service, the formalization of the change in service um, in, in detail so that we are doing our best to um, <clears throat> ensure that the needs of, of our residents um, will be met going forward. Um, I think as Kath has alluded, at the moment, in effect, the wards have been operated as single sex wards um, because our women have been <clears throat> sent to different parts of the country um, and any change from that would be better than um, the situation as it is now. I think we can all agree that that is not a satisfactory situation at all and um, what is being proposed um, is to formalise the arrangements so that uh, mixed sex wards are not set up in the future and um, <clears throat> there will be related issues because one being in Norfolk, one being in Suffolk, as the current proposal suggests, um, you know, poses some issues concerning visitation and um, the ability of patients to interact with their relations. So um, over to you, committee. Please do put questions to Kath. Um, Keith and then um, Keith, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's not so much a question, it's an observation in that the idea of having a joint committee is sound common sense because with NSFT, that does affect greatly both Norfolk and Suffolk in equal measure. And I can envisage other areas where overlap, where a joint committee in the future would be a good idea. Um, Yes, and I do believe that the uh, formalisation of single-sex wards is a major change and should be investigated. So, I'm all for it. 
Thank, thank you very much. That, by that I undertake you both um, believe the formalisation to be substantive and you support the proposed changes. Thank you. Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, at the moment, all the women are, are, are going to quite distant counties, so this will be a great improvement for them to, to, to actually to go to Norfolk. Now, can I ask, what happened to the interior of Walsby? Was it the patients that trashed it? I believe so, Councillor. Right. So, it's going to be lovely and new, so you're going to put the women in it that hopefully won't trash it as much as the men had in the past. Well, um, I think um, the environmental um, damages that can happen in any of our wards aren't necessarily attributed to a particular gender. Okay. Um, but, but the hope is, is with better therapeutic care um, that's more targeted towards the needs of women in Rollsby and ditto in Laugh for men, it might mean then the distraction and the therapeutic care is such that people won't feel that, 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 um, in, that vandalism is the way to express themselves. So hopefully the clinical environment will be more therapeutic and prevent that from happening. Does that make sense, That makes Councillor? huge sense. Uh, and obviously, so it sounds like the, the clinical support they're going to get is going to be much, much superior to what it was in the past. Uh, yeah, I completely Absolutely. support it, yes. And Thank you. I don't know whether this is, I assume, it, Jessica, that it is a substantive change. So it has to go through, but I'm, I, I vote for it to go through straight away without having to go through Norfolk, but it's up to you from a procedural point of view. Thank you. I think from a procedural point of view, it needs to be um, you know, blessed through a joint committee. And um, you know, despite the fact that both committees may separately come to a view, we need to come to a joint view um, <clears throat> because it's a, um, it's a joint trust and um, that is how this um, process has been um, set up. And um, it also, I think, it will be useful for us to come together as a single committee to discuss some of the common issues that will affect residents, things like um, things that we will want the joint committee to look at in more detail, things like um, transport, um, <coughs> You know, transport to and from the various the, the, the patients home to their facility and the interaction with relations um, visitors how all that's going to work um, <clears throat> so you know I think the main maybe what let, let's have some questions but at some point I'll just take a, a show of hands from the committee to um, hopefully support the fact that this joint committee is set up can we can we take that? Um, does 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 anyone believe that we should not set up a joint committee to look at this this change? Good. Well, I think that's um, unanimous from that point of view. Um, hopefully, everyone has, as we discussed, looked at the terms of reference and is happy with those. And um, <clears throat> before we, I think we have also suggested membership of the committee in a previous item so i think that that also is is, is settled but um can i just review that and, and confirm on the, under this item the membership of the committee from here sorry uh, we'll need people to put names forward for this because this wasn't on the the previous item so we'll need to know We'll need four members for this committee and up to two substitutes, and that will be to sit on the joint committee with Norfolk purely for the purpose of looking at these proposals. Thank you. Um, I think it, may we have... Uh, it makes sense for people um, who are maybe involved in the Norfolk Husk already to volunteer, if, if, if that makes sense. So, it, it looks as if we have two volunteers. Would anyone else like to volunteer? Uh, um. I nominate Debbie. Uh, we, have, we have three, and um, 
Let's see, should we, um, should we? It'll be, at the moment it looks like one, but it's possible that it could be two. I think it's extremely unlikely it would be two. The, the, the meeting would be chaired by the chairman of the Norfolk Hosk and would take place in Norwich. And um, I think it's tentatively planned around August, isn't it? Around the sort of last weekish of August. Sorry, Jesse, no, I won't be in the country. You, you won't be there. Um, <clears throat> Margaret? No, that's working now. Um, if it's the end of August, um, it's fine. Otherwise, I'm on granny duty for a new baby. Okay, I'm not sure. I think we'd better have someone who's available the second half of August because I heard it was to be around the early 20s of August. The, I think the 22nd was thrown out as a, as a date, wasn't it? Um, 24th of August has been put forward but that hasn't been finalised and we will work around obviously members availability but that's the kind of time that we're looking at is the end of August. Would you be available for, a, presumably there may be a pre-meet or something that could be electronically accessed before that. Um, Okay, I, I understand, Margaret, you're interested. Could we have a substitute in case Margaret is, is away when the date is decided? Um, Councillor Shaw, would you be interested in case? I'm, I'm not available for those dates, I'm afraid. It, 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 oh, the end of August is perhaps not the best time to start something like this, I, I would say, because I'm, I think like you and other people have got holidays and things and family duties, so it makes it a bit... Especially when a date isn't certain as well. Makes you bet on teams, wouldn't it? Well, I was just wondering about that. It's perhaps more manageable because you can. I, I don't think it's going to be on teams. I think we've got, um, <clears throat> we've got four people, and if Margaret, if you can't do it, I'll do it. So I can put me down as a substitute. Thank you. We're covered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can yeah. I just suggest that we might want to go out to the other members who are not present today? Councillors Mark, Slockington. Um, yeah, just, just to check whether they're... Actually, I thought Councillor Lockington had expressed interest. Yeah. I think the conclusion is um, we have... Um, a number of people who have put their hands up and we, I think it is fair to ask people who aren't here and then we'll... I do apologise, I thought I'd turned it off. Uh, Chairman, if I may interrupt you, um, if one of the other two who are not here is more, is more keen... <laughs> then I'm happy to step back. It's absolutely fine. I'm not offended at all. Well, I, th I really appreciate you. I, I think it's good to have a number of people because at that time of year, um, things can happen. And, and you know, as we all know, we can be struck by COVID as well. So the more, the better, really. Thank you. <clears throat> Teresa, do you have enough to agree membership from, from that discussion? Um, currently, I've got councillors Robinson, potentially Lockington, potentially councillor Maybury, yourself, councillor Fleming, potentially councillor Riches, and then to check with councillor Marks. Councillor. Sorry, I volunteered as well. Councillor. Okay. Good. <clears throat> we, 
we're allowed up to two subs, aren't we? Good. Um, can we identify some lines of <clears throat> inquiry that you know, committee members would like our representatives to, to take? Um, I think we've, uh, we've discussed access and transport for, for patients and their families. Um, Councillor Richards. It would be very helpful to have the number of women and where exactly they are in the country. It will give, uh, provide proper evidence as to why being in Nor Norfolk, not Norwich, would be a good idea for them. That would be handy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Back. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, in, in response to Councillor uh, comments uh, regarding patients being well away from the district, or in fact East Anglia, um, at the last meeting of Norfolk um, Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee last week, um, figures were given. Um, I can't remember what the figures were, but I mean, there were patients up in the northeast in Newcastle, places like that, yeah, a long, long way away. So um, I think anything that would bring them to within sort of 40, 50 miles um, has to be a good thing. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, the costs involved to change it, I would like to know the costs involved. The costs involved in what exactly? To change the current situation to the um, gender separated. Um, okay. It's already com com yeah, it's in compared to, to the current mixed, situation. You mean? So the proposal, how much more would it cost to set into reality? Okay, I don't. I wouldn't expect there to be a, a cost issue, but yeah, we can ask for that. No, the, the ward will be will be refurbished anyway, regardless of what sex is occupying it. Let's ask Kaz. are there any costs involved or nothing at all? It will just be a reshuffle or are there any costs involved? So I'd say um, it, there wouldn't be material increases in costs. We might employ slightly different staffing um, for each of the units. Um, with different skill sets, but I don't think that is considered to be a material cost. If anything, probably it might be better because we are then not purchasing beds out of the trust. Um, so money for mental health services in Norfolk and Suffolk is not being spent elsewhere in the country. And we're also not having to transport people around. Um, and um, we would anticipate length of stay would reduce if people are within the, in our geographical patch because they'll have access to the um, other services that they would benefit from. So I'm not, so I wouldn't suggest this will cost money. Um, we're not doing this as a cost saving exercise, but I think there will be huge benefits to doing this, which include financial. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some questions on the um, number of beds that are being proposed and whether they, um, are sufficient to meet the anticipated need. I think that is an item that probably needs to be explored when the committee meets. Um, and I would also have a question on why we aren't able to establish separate wards in each county. Because that seems the obvious thing to do. And that may involve um, some costing. Um, so I, I would like our members to, to um, ask that question. Does anyone else have? M M Councillor Maybury. Um, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, on page 45 under the first full paragraph, um, excuse me, um, it talks about um, how family carers can access financial support to visit their loved one and make also at looking at making the offer clearer. I think we need to actually decide or have more information on what that actually means, i.e. what financial help, how it's accessed and why does it need to be clearer? 
please. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, right, was, does anyone have any other related lines of inquiry they'd like to propose? Um, I can't think of any at the moment, but um, if you do think of any subsequently, do <coughs> let us know, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Um, Councillor Mabry. Um, thank you, Chairman. I just had one more, and, and I don't know whether um, Kath can answer this one or not. But um, I understand from this paper that this is sort of acute need. Is this acute need for... Um, uh, post maternity or is this not so I'm looking for an answer for that because does that mean that any female ward would need access for um, specialist care for babies or small children so it, it's not anticipated that um, this would be for that group of, of women or people um, we have got the mother and baby unit um, on site in Helsden, um, which is a really great unit for, for women who need that level of care. What I would say is in the on the rare occasion when a woman would need access to PICU care, it probably wouldn't be appropriate mm -hmm. that the baby is with mum anyway because of the baby's safety, but also the mum's um, therapeutic treatment. So I would not anticipate there needing to be any services um, available in the female um, ward for babies. Um, if, a, if, a, if a person was, I think, okay to have their baby with them, they probably wouldn't need PICU, but also, as I say, the mother and baby unit, which is fully equipped, is available on site on Helsin. Does that answer your question, councillor? Um, yes, it does. Thank you very much. That's clarification. Thank you. Right, um, Councillor Flappen. Um, Kath, will this house all the um, lady residents that we need, or is it just a drop in the ocean? Do we need a larger unit? So the 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 um, the, the, the maths that have been undertaken is suggestive that this should be a sufficient number of beds for women and men. Um, if anything, potentially the bed numbers might be able to be slightly reduced, partly because we know that the women who are placed out of area, their length of stay is considerably longer than we would want it to be, for the reasons I described earlier on. Yeah. So actually, when we have a, an, an, an interest provision for single gender, um, what we would anticipate is that therapeutic treatment would be improved and, and women and men would spend less time in the, pedi the um, psychiatric intensive care unit and then would step down into the general yeah. um, acute mental health wards. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, right, I think, um, <clears throat> unless anyone else has anything to add, I think that concludes this item. Um, and Kath, thank you very much for, for joining us and for um, telling us about these proposed changes, which I think, um, I hope I speak for the committee, I think we really welcome and we look forward to meeting with um, Norfolk and getting into more of the detail. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, um, Councillor, and thank you to everyone as well for listening. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'll now go on to um, item 10, which is an information bulletin. And this is a very brief bulletin, just following up on some data that was requested for the, um, <clears throat> the work on childhood obesity um, centered on the Waverley area. So hopefully everyone has had a look at it. Um, are there any questions at all on, on the bulletin agenda item 10? No? Um, Grant. Um, the standing item <clears throat> number 11 is reports from um, our observers. And um, I know um, Councillor Marks has sent in a note 
about her observations. Do we wish to report on, on what she sent in? Um, I wonder if we should just pull that up and... Um, can I suggest I can circulate that outside of the meeting? That would be very helpful, thank you. I think um, it would be good to include that um, so that all members can, can see. <coughs> um, does any other committee member wish to report on um, any boards they've been to and any observations they've made? No, no, no reports. Okay. Um, and finally, we get to the forward work plan, agenda item 12. Um, we need to confirm the main item for scrutiny in the um, October meeting. And um, I'm just wondering, is there any items that may have arisen from today's meeting which we might want to um, add to the work, to the forward work plan, either in the form of a, an information bulletin or um, a scrutiny item. <clears throat> I think um, what we have proposed is an update from West Suffolk Hospital on its future systems program, which they would like to bring to the HOSC for information and questions, um, including an update on the government's approach to the hospital improvement program and, and its implications. Um, I think there <coughs> will have been some, um, some talk about the funding of, the timing of, of the funding coming into the rebuild program, and I think we really would like to hear what's going on with that. Um, and we would also like to talk through any proposed changes to the services that um, will go along with the um, West Suffolk Hospital rebuild and um, whether they have implications to any of our patients. Councillor Maybury. Um, yes, uh, Chairman. I did actually check on the um, planned hospital build to see whether anything had changed and the West Suffolk Hospital is still on there and it's still planned. I thought the committee might like to know that. I did double check. That's, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we had previously thought, um, and, and I think we talked at our pre-meet, that we would like to hear um, <clears throat> a report on the um, CQC inspection of the um, NSFT services in Suffolk, which took place at the end of last year. And the report was issued in, I think, April, wasn't it? Um, and I think an action plan is being developed by NSFT to respond to the findings of the inspection. And um, I think we had decided we'd like to see the action plan. Unfortunately, the inspection um, found that um, the NSFT went from needs improvement to um, being inadequate. So um, there are some serious issues going on in, in both Suffolk and Norfolk. And I think we should, as a responsible committee, we need to know what those are and, and to be confident that they're, they're being addressed. Does everyone agree, um, Councillor Robinson? I was just gonna say on, on that note, NSFT is, I would think that'd be quite an urgent thing for the, a, a, proposed joint committee to look at. So, uh, I mean, I've been to meetings about the NSFT and they tend to be very locally, I've been to the Norfolk one, they tend to be locally focused rather than cover the whole area. Um, so I think that'd be wise to have a, a, a look over a wider area on that one and the effects on the whole region rather than just a narrow Norfolk or Suffolk perspective because it is one organisation. Um, and I, I think if ourselves in Norfolk are singing together with one voice, we will have more impact on N NSFT. Um, they're very hard work, so... <laughs> um, well, that raises the question, um, would the committee like to consider um, 
a scrutiny of NSFT jointly with Norfolk. We have a committee set up, as, as you have pointed out. We've got terms of reference for it, which are suitable for looking at topics other than just the PICU units. And I think um, this may be something that could be usefully looked at jointly. What, what are people's thoughts? Um, I, I would um, support uh, Councillor Robinson's um, suggestion. I think that would be that would be a really good idea. Um, we can't keep having the. I always get this wrong. I get the NSFT. I always get the initials the wrong way around. So I apologise if I still have. Um, we can't have that going from inadequate to poor and you know, vice versa. It's just we ju we just need to be seen to be doing something. So I support Councillor Robinson. Okay, um, I think a question is, do we, um, I mean, and I, I understand there is a certain urgency to it as well. Um, I also understand that there is some, <clears throat> going to be some um, conversation about NSFT going on in the fairly immediate future. And um, it may be very timely to look jointly at the provision of mental health services in Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, Teresa, do you feel that this is something we should communicate with the Norfolk Hosk on and, and, and see if there's a, a common theme here? Uh, yes, my suggestion would be, um, Chairman, to approach the Chairman of Norfolk Hosk for a discussion about what they have or may already have planned mm -hmm. and whether they wish to set something up jointly. Very good. I, I, will, I will do that. Let the committee know. I'll do it sooner than later. Yes. I'd just like to say, I think we, uh, this, that was quite urgent. We need to wait until such a time mm. as we've got the action report so we've got something constructive to work with. We do need the action report here, yeah, the action plan to look at. My feeling is it will probably be available fairly soon. Um, good. Well, that still leaves us um, room at our next October meeting for an agenda item. Um, there have been some items on our forward plan for some time, so maybe we can <coughs> address some of those. Yes, Councillor. The, the other thing that on a more local level is uh, provision of end-of-life care. This is something we looked at a good while ago and we investigated quite thoroughly and involved a particular potential uh, hospice in South Norfolk, North Waveney. Um, and that has gone totally quiet and I'm not aware of any progress in this area of all, at all. So I would you know, propose that we look at this at some stage and uh, you know, agitate a little bit to get, see what's happening. Okay. Um, end of, what do people feel about putting end of life care on our forward work plan? Do you, do you think that's appropriate? Um, other things that we had on our um, program are whistleblowing arrangements in the NHS, um, digitalisation and shared records. I feel that one needs to be left a bit until the ICP, ICB system progresses a bit further. I, I don't think this is the right time to look at that. Um, <coughs> let's see. We've had East of England ambulance on our forward plan and we always have patient transport so um but there are there are a myriad of other things we could be looking at do you feel we've got enough teresa to to go on with with end of life care and um i would suggest if um it, it's a scrutiny review not having more than two items two main items on the agenda for october
think it's probably too early to ask for updates on how this integration is going. Um, at the moment, though, I do think we need to look at that after a few months. Um, Councillor Richards. Do we have something on drug rehabilitation? Because no. drug rehabilitation, drug addicts, because there's a whole lot, load of money coming from the government mm -hmm. and the Health and Wellbeing Board are setting up a rehabilitation network uh, jointly with the police to treat drug addicts and try and reduce the market for class A drugs. It would be nice to get a, a bottom line as to where it is now so we can compare what it's like in the future when all this has kicked off and is working. That sounds like a good idea. Can we get an information bulletin on that? And that might well be a, an area for future scrutiny work, actually. Another item which we periodically looked at and which <clears throat> doesn't seem to go away is the delivery of um, contraception and sexual health services, because that, again, is one of those shared services that um, doesn't always run very well. Um, the, the, and at, at actually at lunch we were talking about um, primary care and um, you know, GP access and you know, taking into account the fact that it's clear that we need to go easy on, on GPs and, um, <laughs> and, and be kind to them. I, I think we still do need to, to know how easily it is for our um, residents to access primary care. Um, Theresa. Um, the committee is due to receive a 12 monthly update on the recommendations from October 21 on previous scrutiny of primary care in October. That sounds really timely, Theresa. And um, let's make sure we get a, a good update on that. And um, if we need to take it back to scrutiny, we can do. Uh, I feel we've got plenty there. And um, I think we'll, we'll send around the proposals and then um, members do feel free to feed back because there are quite a number of things there and we can't do them all. And we'll prioritize what we need to do next. Um, so there's nothing else, any, any other business to raise? Um, then I'll close the meeting. Thank you all very much.